board meeting for Tuesday, January 18th, 2022. Roll call, please. Uh, Mark Castonia. Here. Deborah Lundberg. Here. Aideen Hess is excused. Chris Serbel. Here. Donovan Miller. Here. Tracy Flukey. Here. And Heidi Murphy is here. Here. Yeah. <coughs> please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. <coughs> Action on on uh, the agenda. Anybody? We have a motion. We have a second. A second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, comments from the public. I have two here. One is from. Uh, let's see. First one is from uh, DSAW, uh, which is a Down Syndrome <laughs> Association of Wisconsin. Dear Rex, we'd like to take this opportunity to extend a sincere thank you for your generous in kind donation of a family swim pass to Oshawa and Lake for the 2022 swim season, valued at $90 to our 13th annual. Down syndrome awareness walk. Your kind hearted support will help improve the lives of thousands of individuals, individuals with Down syndrome and their families. Then it goes on with the, the mission statement. And um, the SAW is 100% funded by private individuals and concerned corporate citizens and foundations that believe, just as we do, that the appropriate investment and just the right amount of support. Our loved ones can accomplish amazing things. Thank you for being part of such a magnificent. Magnific magnificent group of people and for all that you do for Down Syndrome Associated of Wisconsin warmly, Don Naufer. And the second one is, I, this is from Tom Selk. I would like to thank the Village of Ashwaubenon for letting AARP tax aid utilize the company, uh, the community center to prepare tax returns for low income and senior citizens. The facility and electronics make it excellent place to hold training and prepare taxes. Last year, 297 returns were processed in Ashwaubenon, even with COVID reducing our numbers. This year, we will again be processing returns on Wednesdays in Ashwaubenon. When a problem arose concerning our former Green Bay site, Ashwaubenon was able to accommodate our program in order for us to also process tax returns in Ashwaubenon on Fridays. This will allow us to serve hundreds of additional clients as a member of the AARP tax aid program. Again, thank you at Schwabenen, Tom Selk. Uh, oh, comments were public, I missed that. Um, comments from the public. Anybody here from the public <laughs> or online? Anybody, comments from the public? Nobody, okay. Um, action on consent agenda. I move to approve the minutes from, what date was it? October 19th, 2021. Second. <coughs> we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Action items, uh, we have a report on uh, 2021 Ashwaubenon Community Pool Report. <laughs> Rex and Melody. Uh, I gave all my extra ones to Sue. Sue, do you have some an extra sheet for Rex? Pardon me? An extra pick, packet for Rex that oh, I gave you? Just to, just to pull one, I'll grab it. Um, okay, hi guys. Um, so I am here to give uh, just kind of an overview of 2021 um, at the pool for um, the season. I did pass out um, two pieces of paper that have some different charts and stuff. So we'll just kind of go through those. Stop me if you have any questions. Um, it's just kind of an overview of where we're at. So starting with some of our programs, 
Um, these are the programs that we were able to run in 2021. 2021 was a little, we're getting back to running some things that we haven't been able to run and some things we didn't, weren't able to start again. So um, some of our, our programs that weren't able to start again was one of our aqua boot camps. Um, that's a program that we would run with Aurora. We partner with Aurora. They provide physical therapists and due to their staffing changes that one of that, those programs was ended. But all of our other programs um, have been up and running since uh, at smaller numbers in the beginning of the winter season and then as, as we progressed in spring and summer, we were able to get back to those more pre-COVID numbers. Um, just a couple things that I want to note. Uh, lifeguard training has changed throughout all of this. Um, we used to charge $125 to run a lifeguard training program per person. Um, that has now gone to free um, to try and help combat the, the lifeguard um, shortage that is going around. Um, we do ask for the payment that we have to pay to the Red Cross for their certification, which is $41. But then in turn, if they end up working for us for three months, we refund that $41. So um, and I teach the course, so there's no expense there um, other than what we, we give them back their money. So um, it's worked out okay. We've um, gotten plenty of lifeguards out of it. It is a, a plus for them to be able to get a job and you know get certified, but um, that was definitely something that's changed throughout. Um, if we keep kind of moving on to rentals, um, we didn't start rentals until summertime in 2021. I have, I'm working with the school district. We kind of have like this balance where what are the school district requirements versus the village requirements. So um, I'm in constant contact with them as, as far as where they are with some of the rules and stuff like that. Um, we were able to start the programs back up in summer of 20. Um, but the rentals allow people into the building that we don't, we don't have a list for. So when you sign up for a program, we know everybody that's in our building at all times, um, but the rentals kind of didn't have that option. So the school district we, and I worked together and we kind of held off on that until they felt more comfortable. So you can see that in the beginning, obviously we didn't have very many rentals, but they are picking back up again. Um, open swim was the same. So we've run noon hour lap swim um, throughout 2021. In the beginning of 2021, it was a lane reserve, so we knew everybody that was in the building, again, with that contact tracing. And as summer progressed, we, we went back to just open. Anyone can use a lane at any time. So um, those are picking back up, as well as after summer, we started our weekend open swims for families, um, which is greatly used. I was actually <laughs> got called in for on Sunday and we were at capacity for our warm water pool for our open swim. So um, that was nice to see that people are now getting out utilizing it again. Um, so yeah, if you continue on, the swimming lesson on the second page kind of gives you an overview of what swimming lessons were like. As you can, as you can see in winter, our numbers are smaller um, because we were still doing those, pro those COVID protocols. My instructors were teaching out of the water on the deck and parents were in the water with their children. Um, so those numbers are obviously smaller, but as spring progressed and fall season, you can see that um, our numbers have increased because we were able to add more people into the pool because we weren't counting a parent and a child together. So um, those have been running smoothly and people appreciated the fact that we had them throughout COVID, um, although not many parents really like to get into the water so much with their kids to do it, but I think it was a good bonding experience for the most part. And at least we were able to offer that to the community. Um, summer swimming lessons, the totals for that are down there as well. Um, summer swimming lessons is a little different and I'm not sure if everyone's aware of how those work. Um, it is a partnership with the school district. So the school district gets DPI credits um, for the first three sessions of swimming lessons for a portion of time during those swimming lessons. And during that portion of time, the school district then pays the lifeguard wages during that time and then receives the revenue during that time. So it's some of the numbers are kind of hard to figure out when we're, we're piecing things together. But, um, and in turn, the school district also requires that the supervisor at the pool be a licensed teacher. Um, which can be hard to find a licensed teacher with aquatic experience, but I'm very lucky that some of my lifeguards 
have then grown up to be teachers and have come back to me. And so I actually have two certified Wisconsin teachers on staff that fill that spot for them. And then the school district then covers that cost all summer long. So um, some things that I'm that are going on at the pool and that have kind of been good this year. I have I had a pretty senior staff this summer um, as far as coming back to the pool. So a lot of my lifeguards are on their five, fifth or sixth year teaching with us. Um, so that was nice to have. I I think that one of the struggles that we're dealing with is obviously the COVID that's happening. Um, not necessarily that I have a staffing issue that's going on, but just the bugs that are going around. Sometimes I'm struggling to keep healthy staff um, and make sure all the shifts are filled and stuff like that. But otherwise, the pool um, has successfully ran all through 2021 um, with m small stops in programs and stuff like that due to different spikes and stuff. But otherwise, it's it's been really good. Anyone have any questions about the pool? Why do they require a licensed teacher in that position? I don't, I think that- DPI credits, because they receive yeah. credits from the state for the swim lessons, and you have to have a <clears throat> supervisor who is a, a certified teacher to receive the DPI credits. Okay. And that, that has to do with their funding formula. So they actually get funding for them being in charge of some of our swim lesson program during okay. the summer. Can it be a retired teacher? Uh, current certification. It has to be a current certification, okay. yeah. Okay. So I've been lucky throughout all of this to be able to find somebody that then has aquatic experience and then can really, you know, knows how to, you know, supervise the lifeguards and, and has done it. So um, both instructors are, well, one is a Green Bay, um, but he has been with us for a long time, and the other one is a substitute teacher for us, Kabanon. So um, it's nice to have them. Melon, during the summer, do you offer just one, I don't know, it looks like two sessions for evening classes? Just two sessions for evening classes. How do those um, go? I mean, it looks like the numbers are pretty good. Yes, those are, because they're evening a lot of people are able to come after work a lot of the numbers that come during the day in the middle of the day are stay-at-home moms or daycare centers will come in this year we didn't get as many daycares as we traditionally do because the daycares weren't going a lot of places and so um but yeah no the evening lessons work out good but um we do have to i would like to offer more however girl swim season starts and then they they pull that time frame so so what are the dates on those is it early in the summer then that those sessions are Correct, yep. My one question, <clears throat> how long does the lifeguard certification last? Two years. Two years, so yep. I, I mean, from what you told me, it's a no brainer that you would, you would, if you can teach the class to just recoup the fees to have your staff, because I know earlier in the year you talked about having the staffing issues, so it's a perk for you gives them a little bit of incentive to stay on because they get that small check back and they're certified. So I think that's a value. It's, uh, getting, it's getting very cutthroat out in the pool and it's going to be even more so this coming summer in the aquatic arena, basically. Um, don't know if you have seen, just this week it was announced, the city of Green Bay's got a $350 sign-on bonus yeah. for anyone that, that guards for them. If they guard through the summer, on top of their regular wages, they'll get a bonus, a 300, I mean, it, it's not a small bonus. That's a, that's a pretty nice, that's another check. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole <laughs> um, So, I mean, that's how <clears throat> cutthroat and serious it's getting where, where everyone's trying to pull lifeguards from, from everybody else to try and make sure their pools are staffed. If, if, <clears throat> if you're not aware, City of Green Bay was not able to run all three of their pools last year. I think only two of their pools were operational because of the shortage. So luckily, Mel runs a good operation uh, the kids enjoy working for her. Um, we use some of our supplies and expense money to buy little treats and little, you know, pizza parties and, 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 and little kudo type gifts throughout the course of the summer, little fun things. It's, it's sometimes it's just the little things. If they enjoy working for you, that's, that's huge. You know what I mean? It's not necessarily I can make a buck more over here. Some people will always go somewhere because of, you know, a little bit more money. Yeah. But, but, uh, but we, we've been trying to focus more on, on the kudos. Now, the pier, 
um, opened up their uh, outdoor aquatic center last year. Um, there'll be a big piece of competition for us this year. Their, their wage rate, I'm afraid to say it, <laughs> is gonna be $5 more per hour. They're going to be. They're, they just voted to go seventeen dollars an hour for a lifeguard, wow. and we're 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 just over twelve. Um, so it, it, it again, it's becoming very cutthroat. We'll be looking at how we do this summer and and and, and wage rates moving forward. But but uh, Mel's been doing a great job of keeping kids under our umbrella and and keeping them happy working with us. Well, I'd say this is a good formula to, as a start, you know, like at least they don't have to pay for, you know, um, the class. I will, I'm, I'm anxious to see less, at the end of last summer, um, I have 23 lifeguards on staff at the lake and 20 of them said they'd be returning this coming summer. I did have a very new staff at the lake. Mm -hmm. And um, like Rex said, I do cater a lot to them on a lot of levels um, and I, do it and is it exhausting? Yes, but I do it for my own benefit in that they stay with me and they um, help me out. And then in turn, where I'm with them, they come home for winter break. I have seven lifeguards from college that are home that are really helping me out in this time where we've kind of got this bug going around and they've really pulled some hours. So I appreciate them coming back and they're very loyal and um, have helped me out a lot. So, so does that give you enough? Um enough bodies to um, to fill uh, sick days and things like that? Yes, so at the lake, yes. But here at the pool, yeah, these kids have definitely put in the hours and they're, they really are a good group. They all really know each other. They know when one of them's not feeling great and they'll step up and help out. So I, number number wise for lifeguards, I, I am good. It's- We've got um, a lot of them going back to college. But I have that big group weekend. that leaves this weekend. <laughs> so I'm I'm getting through this week and then and then I might be spending a lot of time there. But um, <laughs> um, so yeah, <clears throat> I'm heading back there actually right directly after this. So I, I have boys high school meet that's going on senior night, so. Okay. Um, one quick question. I noticed on the program swim clinic, you know, we're, we're heavily weighted towards residents versus non-residents. Um, but under swim clinic, we got three resident, 24 non-resident. Swim clinic is a privately contracted class. So oh, it's okay. run by a, a gentleman by the name of um, Brian McWilliams. He runs a triathlon clinic. And so he, this is his program. We take registration, we, we do it as a contracted, and then we do a 70-30 split. So oh. a lot of his people are are from wherever, right. so that's why it's not necessarily a Nashwabanon based um, right. program. We just host it and for him. Right. Okay. Thank you. Since you guys know right now that Green Bay is going to be bumping up, the pier is going to bump up their wages. Do you think it's time for us to look at it now and see what our wages are? Four or five dollars an hour less right now. You know, you have great you recruit staff. You do a really good job with that melody, but. We may have to bump our wages also. So I guess that's my question to Joel and Rex to th look into and see if we have the budget and we can look at raising our wages because we may not get people. I mean, they may go elsewhere just because it's a brand new facility in De Pere. Green Bay, you know, they might just want to work in Green Bay. And the $5 an hour is, is a big difference. So I think we really need to look at that. I don't want all of a sudden Melody, you know, in June or May going, oh crap, we don't have enough people to open our pool or or get things going at the lake. These numbers have just come out with Green Bay and with De Pere and stuff like that. So I do think that it would be prudent of us to at least get something in place if this does become a problem because you're right. It's not it's not just a higher on process. There is a ton of training that I do with these kids prior hours and hours and hours of training I do with them. So if we do come into a situation where we don't have enough, I mean I I would need yeah the option to be able to offer them something. So I, I think that it would be smart to, yeah, at least have something in the works. Yeah, so she, re, I mean, you're returning staff too. You said you've got a bunch that are committed well to bump them and know that they're not gonna jump ship at the last minute and go to Green Bay or to Pier. I just think it's something to really think seriously about because you need those people. I do, so. I absolutely do. Anything else? Any other questions? Nope, we're good. 
this is a little out of sequence, but congratulations for the yeah. award for the great elf hunt program, which yeah. I understand you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I, yeah, I accept that award um, in February, so that's exciting. Yeah. My yeah. little step out of aquatics is, is going in the right direction, so. Yeah. Well, we, we noticed that on Facebook where the, the, the elves are captured. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a pretty busy like three weeks there for me where I'm yeah. online all the time posting. They really, it really was fun. It's, yeah, it, it's so it's, much fun. It seems like a really a neat program. For those mm -hmm. of you that are unaware, the, the program is Santa's elves have escaped the North Pole and they're hiding in our parks. And, and uh, every week there are certain parks that they're gathering at and they're hiding. And so then we let people know on Facebook what parks they are hiding in. And if you are able to find and bring back Santa's elves to our office, there's a special prize bag for you. I couldn't find any. <laughs> <laughs> this year was nice too, because this is the second year that I've done it. And um, the first year, um, just to see how it went. And then this year, um, we actually got a donation from um, Crowley Dental and Ashwabnon to cover the cost of all Santa's um, prizes. So that was nice. So I hope to keep that partnership with them and, and keep the program going. So yeah, that's good. Well, thanks. Thanks, I'm Mel. I'm off to a swim meet, so. <laughs> All right, for information only. Oh, next we have uh, Don Chilson from the um, Cornerstone Community Center with an update on things are how things are going. Um, <coughs> I asked to put put this on the agenda <coughs> a few months ago, um, not because I was concerned for anything at all. It's just that since I've been on the village board. Um, Recently, we haven't heard any updates on it. It was used to be something when I was on the park board. Don would, would or we'd at least get a packet, but sometimes Don would come in front of us and um, okay. and um, <laughs> give us some updates. And I just felt that I think as, as long as the village has stake in in the in the uh, in the process of the Cornerstone Community Center, we should probably just maybe once a year just hear from Don. And in case somebody's got any questions, Don does a good job over over at um, at the community center, but. I figure it's about time he maybe shows his face here, even though he's busy, <laughs> too busy. We're good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, I know most of you actually, but for those who don't know you, I'm Don Chilson. I've been at the Cornerstone now for, this is the 21st year. So we've been around the village of Schwabenheim for quite some time now. Um, never thought we'd deal with what we dealt with last year when we, or 2020 when we got shut down. Um, that year we lost 30% of our income and uh, we've been, you know, once that happened we needed to fight back as fat, hard as we could and do as much business as possible in order to try and make up for the losses that we had, especially when it first happened because we didn't have any idea what was going to go on. Um, so last year we took everything we could in. Uh, we had one of our best years ever. Uh, we were able to steal things from Chicago, Minneapolis, Detroit because they were not all closed down and Brown County and Eshwabon were open, uh, which was our savior. And you know, Brown County Health Department worked with us to stay open. You guys all worked with us to make sure we could stay open, host events. Hotels in town were happy to, to, have, to host, um, host teams here. Um, and then it's always been a great place for people to come visit because uh, we're, you're still coming to a small town. So you come here and the hotel people treat you differently and the restaurant people, treat you, everybody treats you differently when you uh, come here from out of town, especially if you're coming from the big cities. Um, but yeah, so we ended up having a, a pretty good year last year where we brought in a whole bunch more events, which if you look at the, re the report I typed up for you, um, about twice as many events as we typically would hold in a year we held last year. Um, basically because we just want to turn, turn anything down and then we sought out a few places that we figured we're going to be shut down, so we actively went out to a few people and um, tried to grab things from, especially the Chicago area where we knew um, things were not going to lighten up very much at all. Um, all of our hockey programs continued to operate last year. We dealt with all kinds of restrictions that nobody's ever dealt with, but everybody was happy to play. Uh, our skating classes stayed open. We cut sizes down in half, um, but we kept everything going as much as we could uh, over at the Cornerstone. Um, Highlight of our 
pandemic, though, was the fact that we got the uh, front entrance rebuilt. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not have to shovel snow anymore with Glenn. <laughs> so uh, that, that's been received very well, especially with the pass through lanes um, to be able to attach the parking lots together now. And we really, the utilization of the parking lot over by the soccer field has been, has really helped alleviate some of the traffic problems that we do have uh, when we have those really busy nights out there. Um, much like your pool, staffing's been our biggest problem. Competing in the wages right now has been crazy for getting high school staff. So we've really neglected the public skating over the last year because we just don't have the staff to handle the public skating. Um, we've even had the figure skating club has run a bunch of uh, Friday night open skates for us and they've collected all the revenue for it. So they've used it as a fundraiser, but they've done a lot of those uh, public skating events for us so, since we haven't had the staff to do it. Um, as you remember, we've got a couple of lease spaces that are up there, and those lease spaces continue to be full. Um, Mind Right Performance is a training center, and uh, it's owned by Chase M. Knott, and he runs the training center, and then he's also got uh, partners, um, MV, MT, Physical Therapy. Uh, they use, a space, use his space also, and they're running a physical therapy and rehab um, out of, that, out of the, the lease spaces are there. And we've also still carved out a little spot where we um, partner with Green Bay Youth Hockey and it's got a shooting room and stick handling space so the kids could kind of work on off, off, uh, off ice, but it's on synthetic ice in there uh, for different practices and then some of the teams use it for extra practice space. Um, other than that, we've had what I think has been a great relationship with the village of Ashwaubenon. We've been lucky that somebody in their divine wisdom invited them out to be part of the sports complex long ago, which used to be out in the middle of nowhere and no longer is. Um, and uh, just thank you guys for sticking with us for this long. Anybody's got any questions? Fire away. Why don't you talk about, uh, I always find it interesting, like what are, because your building is getting to be about what, 20, 21 years old right now. Talk <laughs> about, uh, you know, getting the boards replaced on rink number one was a big deal. Talk a little bit about that, what some of the upcoming expenses are and how you how you might plan on handling some of them. Yeah, so uh, over the last bunch of years, in the last 10 years, anything extra that we've made has kind of been reinvested right back into the building. Obviously, air conditioning units, heating units, hot water heaters, um, all of the technology for at least rinks one and two is 20 years old. Well, we've updated all that technology. So the, the, while the compressor system essentially is the same, the cooling plant is essentially the same, all the components of it are essentially new except for a couple of, of pieces. Uh, a couple of years ago, we, we redid the whole control system. Um, we redone the dehumidification system twice now, uh, which has really saved the bones of the building because it Tracy probably remembers how wet it used to be in there. <laughs> um, so we've, we've been tackling capital projects as far as just things that wear out on an as-needed basis. Um, this year with the profits that we were able to pull in, uh, we partnered with St. Norbert, did a big $250,000 project with the replacing of the boards. So we had those boards replaced uh, early this fall uh, and they got in just before the hockey season started. Um, next year, we've got some issues with one of the floors that's got some leaks in it, so we'll be repairing the floor in the springtime. So one of the rinks will be shut down in the spring in order to kind of take care of that stuff. Um, so we've got a laundry list of things that we just kind of peck at. And, you know, as soon as we pull something off the list, it's just no different than any other public facility, right? It, you pull one thing off the list and another thing gets added on the back end of the list. So uh, just trying to continue to replace things before they, instead of just band-aiding them up, we just re we've been replacing things lately. So, especially the things that are 20 years old. And it's kind of funny, you know, the, the parts, you know, we have all the same heaters and one part goes out in one heater and then over the next two months, the same part goes out in every other heater. So it's just, the, the lifespan of these things is very predictable. <laughs> There's been, rumors for the last couple of years, probably more pre-COVID than, than currently, about St. Norbert potentially wanting to expand uh, or grow their their rink or their seating capacity. Um, 
Can you maybe, from what you know, touch base on, on that, just so the, the board might know what's happening there? The, the St. Norbert coach and his alumni would, you know, love to see an addition put on that creates a brand new, you know, they're, when they moved into that building, the locker room facilities that they had were the best in Division Three hockey. Well, 20 years later, everybody has the best in Division Three hockey in order for recruiting. So there's been, there's, there's a, a wish out there that they could build on, a, essentially they wanted to start with building on space for new locker room facilities that would give them a little bit more ability. For any of you who haven't been out there, the St. Norbert locker room is essentially stuffed underneath the bleachers. So it's 10 foot ceilings on this side and it's two foot ceilings on this side. <laughs> So it's a little bit of an awkward space, but they've, they've done really, it, it's a very nice space that they've just kind of figured it out pretty well. Um, but now you go, and just like the high schools, you know, everybody's got this fancy pants locker room and they've got TVs and weight rooms and all this, this kind of stuff now. So in order to try and keep up, St. Norbert uh, coaches would like to, you know, and the alumni would like to do something to put a little more pizzazz back into their program. Um, so of course, whenever you start with something simple, it, turn, it sometimes blows up into a big thing. And then they're like, well, wouldn't it be nice to have this? And wouldn't it be nice to have this? And before you know it, uh, there's plans for trying to do a fourth rink. And that plan has been kicked around for five years or more, probably more than five years. Um, we've got drawings that somebody did for us. You know, We had some estimates. Obviously, those estimates are way out the door now. Um, but we've got uh, an ice problem that we've known is going to be coming at some point. You've got, you know, the two youth organizations in, in Brown County are growing and they've done fantastic jobs of getting their programs to grow. The learn to skate programs, the learn to play hockey programs for the last three years are sold out. We can't put enough kids in the programs. We actually restricted the age groups. Um, we've, we've, we, don't, we won't let kids below four in and we now don't take kids over 10 so we can try and get the kids who are going to be hockey players in there um, and try and try and focus a little, little bit at least on the kids that are going to be using the Cornerstone for years instead of kids that are just coming out there once, once a week for an hour. Um, so because of that and, the, and then the initiatives that the youth hockey programs and the figure skating club have done to try and grow, they've all grown and we're at the point where we're packed, we're filled and we're filled prime time, right? We're filled from October to the beginning of March. We're filled on weekends, and um, that's the crunch of the hockey season, and that's where we're most packed. And so, which lends us to why people would like to see a fourth rink, because we're just running out of space for everybody to, to be there at a reasonable hour. We've gotten to the point this year where high school practices, you know, mostly, certain teams are getting done at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, which doesn't sound terrible, but we're in a town where being done by 10 o'clock at night is pretty typical, you know. So um, there's always going to be that pressure. And at this point, there's been nobody who's been willing to kind of grab it and run it because that's a big fundraising task that's gonna, that would have to happen to get that done. And um, at this point, nobody's kind of grabbed it and run with it just yet. It's always sitting there. It's always talked about. But at this point, it's talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think the uh, St. Norbert alum portion of that is the key right yeah finding because there's a lot of alum and uh, they do come here to play hockey and if they've had any success hockey or otherwise and they've played that usually hits home to them so. and we've been very fortunate a lots of lots of those players have gone on to be very successful yeah. and have stayed local so we've been fortunate yeah. in that case because what we're seeing now is you know we're 20 years in with the cornerstone and so I'm seeing kids that um, played are now with, here coaching their kids. So we've seen a whole cycle of group come from start to finish. Tracy, there's people who are on the board whose grandchildren are now playing. Oh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we're kind of at. We've really had a whole generation come through now. Where's the next uh, cornerstone as far as from Green Bay? Is there one? There's probably Appleton's got something. shauno has got something. Is well, there any? Appleton added the Champion Center. They have two sheets of ice there. So there's actually four rinks that are in the Appleton area now. Um, there's not really another, there's not really another, another cornerstone uh, really in the state of Wisconsin. 
Um, we have the three rings here uh, plus the pier, which gives us the yeah. four. Because we have three rings on one site, uh, events are drawn here because if you're going to run a tournament here, you can do it under one roof. You can go big. Yeah. And Don, um, Don and CC, they, they manage the De Pere Ice Center right. as well. It's under, it's under their umbrella. Gotcha. And then the other thing we have going for us, which you know, believe it or not, Appleton doesn't have, is we have enough hotel rooms to handle a Packer playoff game <laughs> and actually a hockey tournament because we're mm -hmm. having a hockey tournament next weekend and uh, we got all the team's hotel rooms somehow. <laughs> so we have enough hotel rooms in this town where um, we can take a, the same event that's held in Chicago and host it here because we don't have the issue that a lot of the other towns do that just don't have, uh, they don't have the rooms to hold the people. We got such an interesting agenda tonight because it's the, uh, the harder side of the parks, right? Where we're not so much talking about the trails and the trees, but um, all the other services that are at the parks or under the parks that, like you're mentioning here, we're drawing in all this revenue for the businesses and we're, we're now a partnership with all of, uh, all the community on this, right? So like um, improvements to the cornerstone or improvements to the community, right? So um, that's awesome. And I think we're gonna touch base on that in the next agenda item as well, where um, the, we're using the parks as a hub to bring people here, right? Um, I think of Ashwabame, <clears throat> it's on that corner, it's on the corner of the village and you know, like, kids can't really bike there so you need a destination and cornerstones on the other side of the village where unless you're driving by on your tractor you know you really don't have any reason to go there so what great what great places to use for to draw people from outside and to spend money in the local you know community um so awesome i, I appreciate that you thank you tried so hard the last two years to keep things going you know, at 16 outside tournaments come in during hard times. I, those hotels are probably doing backflips when you called the ass. So, you know, that's all. That's awesome. We've got great relationships with the hotels here. <laughs> Don, I'll, I'll ask you uh, one final question. Um, just has to do. Obviously, <clears throat> when the the original facility was built with the two rinks, there were loans, bonds that were taken out, um, and then with the the, the rush rink. That was added. That was there was a second loan. Are, 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 is the CCC whole in terms of staying on track for those payments and, and where, I guess where in general are are they? Because I, I last time we were at a we had our virtual meeting a couple months ago. Um, I know that you were getting pretty close, right, to, to paying one of those off. Or well, the, the original bond has now been paid off for several years now. There we go. Yep. Um, and then the bond that we took for the the addition for Ring Three, the Resh Pavilion, um, that bond was 4.5 million or 4.2 million, and now we are down to uh, just over one million dollars. That's great um, on our bond there. So that's great. We've never missed a payment all the way through the pandemic and everything. We've never missed a payment. So uh, I think we've been a pretty good steward for the um, to the banks, and Nicolay Bank has taken great care of us through everything. So. Good. Don, does the financial you have on here, does this include the De Pere facility as well, or is this strictly just the Cornerstone? It's uh, strictly Cornerstone, but on the Brown County balance sheet, the balance sheet. Actually, if you go, actually, it's on the Brown County P&L page. here there is a line item for us which is our income from De Pere. our income from De Pere, uh we split 50 percent with the city of De Pere. um okay. is that the ice rental private no it might actually not show up so we get to the last page here is it yeah it's on the last page under other income and it says De Pere ice arena income And so the year of the pandemic, we actually we had to close it down before we were actually able to turn any profit over there. <laughs> so we actually made no money the, the year of the pandemic over there. Um, and then last year, we had a very good year. 
Uh, this year should be a good year over there too because we've actually had it open longer than uh, we have in a while. Um, we open that one seasonally. There's some issues with the floor over there where there's some frost in the ground. So we've really got to take it, the ice out of there for at least five months every year. But with the boards going into Cornerstone this year, we needed the sheet of ice. So we had actually opened uh, to the Pier Ice Center earlier this year. Um, but yeah, so that's what that number represents is just half of the income that we have there. The rest of the income goes to the city to the Pier. And then they put that into a fund that helps um, the capital expenses over at the um, at the Depeer Ice Arena. So are they responsible then for the capital? They're the responsible building? for the capital items over there. Right. Um, there's a lot of, we, we, we tend to take a lot of our profit and reinvest it into that building. The building's been up since 1972 and capital improvement wise, there hasn't been much that was ever done to it. Um, so since we took over, which is now, I think we took over that in 2012, um, we've invested uh, between us and the city well over a half a million dollars has been put back into that building. Um, so there's been quite a, an, an investment in there to try and keep that building viable. And it, it's, it's a necessary building right now. If that one were to close, there would be not enough room for everybody. <laughs> Any major events coming up this year? Tournaments, national um, tournaments, we, anything? Just our typical events this year, uh, 2000 and 23, we did not get a national tournament, but we did get, we are gonna be able to get one for the 2024 season. Uh, and the USHL combines are coming back in April of 2023. Yeah, 2023, so okay. those that we stole from Chicago. Yeah. They are back to Chicago this year, and then we'll have them back for, I think they're doing a three or a five year deal to come back up to Green Bay. Oh, thanks. Well, have mm -hmm. you had them before, or did they? They were one of the events of us when that they came we, up here. They uh, were one of the events that we were able to snag from Chicago <laughs> for the first time. Yep. Okay. And they brought it up here, and uh, you know, imagine if you're a coach working that event, and you're five minutes from the hotel instead of a forty-minute drive in traffic. <laughs> yeah. So, it was even even the people who came here, you know, to be able to r drop your kid at the rink, go back to the hotel come back to the rink, watch your kid. I mean, the, the logistics of it were just much simpler. So the reason they even went back this year was just because we are more expensive than the, the place that they have it in Chicago, but the place in Chicago subsidizes it because they have this huge bar and restaurant. And I'm sure that they use that to subsidize the ice time. So they, they bring them in quite a bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, but Brown County was able to finagle some funding to help bring, to tempt them to come back and help subsidize the ice time here, so. So those events will be coming back. <coughs> okay. Can I ask one more question about the fourth rink? Mm -hmm. If that would go in, I would assume it's gonna head to the south, like towards the tennis courts and basketball courts. Um, our tennis courts and basketball courts are in very poor shape out there. Um, do you have, I mean, it's like something has to be done with the tennis courts to keep them viable, but we don't wanna put a bunch of money into them because if they're gonna be gone, you know, I know it's really up in the air, but any feel on you think it'll be five years, 10 years, it'll be two years. I mean, any talk recently again, kind of bumping that up again? Um, you know, it, you know how this is gonna go is, well, I'll tell you that no, nothing's gonna happen in the next five years. And then six months from now, yeah. somebody will pick it up and run with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I could tell you this, that when we went through the, the, the budget process to try and see what it was going to cost the last time to at least see what the fundraising dollar was going to be. Um, one of the things, you know, obviously it was going to impede on the tennis courts. So in our construction budget was to replace those tennis courts, relocate them somewhere else. So that was a, an expense that, you know, if we're moving into that space, we just assume that that was something that we were going to have to include. Yeah. So we had that, that that's in our, in our line items Thanks. for that. Very, well, you get very, that very precursory. <laughs> conversations right. on it. Yeah. They're aware. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Don? All right. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Don. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Good. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rex. Right. Yeah. All right. Next up, we've got a uh, Discussion and possible action on a proposed uh, partnership for kayak rental station at um, Ashwabame Park. Uh, this is Don Chick. 
Yes, hello. <laughs> um, Don is the one that approached us, the village, uh, in early January. Um, wondering about the possibility of, of running a, a kayak rental operation out of Ashwaubenay. Um, Don currently runs an operation out of the uh, city of Algoma, uh, something very similar. And he's got a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation um, to, to show you guys this evening. So, Don, I'll, I'll let you tell a little bit about, about yourself and All right. let you take the floor. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Don, obviously, and I'm currently uh, owner at Explore Goma, which is a kayak rental uh, location that we have in Algoma, Wisconsin. And I actually approached the city with uh, this exact thing you know, on a different scale, but um, I'm going to kind of just go over my proposal and vision and idea of, you know, what I think we could possibly do at the park. Um, yep. Obviously, kind of just came up with the name. I mean, it's up for debate. <laughs> but something to put on there. So just Ashwaba, Ashwaba May Adventures, kind of a little concept picture down there for you. Um, and then uh, basically, you know, today we at Explore Goma, we'd like to welcome you to the future, possibly. Ashwaba May Adventures, you know, kayak, water sport, rental establishment. Um, obviously, given an opportunity, we'd like to partner and obtain a lease and a second location with Ashwaba May Park. We assure you of uh, exceptional service and commitment that we've proven year after year with the city of Algoma for three plus years now, going on our fourth season. Uh, can we just have you lean into the mic a bit? Oh, sure. Thank you. I'm always known for loud voice. I'm surprised you had to ask mm -hmm. me that. <laughs> So, um, you know, if we were to bring this uh, location to reality, uh, we'd provide exemplar opportunity to provide a family-friendly environment for all ages to create memories that will last a lifetime. Um, just a little conceptual drawing I kind of had drawn up, just kind of get some ideas flowing. Um, kayak launch for ADA. Um, we like to work with disabled, people and foundations, make a wish, um, things like that. And um, I kind of picked over by the boat launch area. Um, I know it's kind of a flood plain and these are temporary structures. So, but uh, we are open to, if there's another location that works better in the park, um, you know, just kind of getting the ball rolling with some ideas here. Um, as far as mission vision, uh, mission provide exceptional service to be an exclusive adventure location that will make memories of a lifetime uh, for our vision, uphold high standards for our clients and community while being creative, exciting, and most importantly, provide a safe, memorable, and fun adventure. Uh, we're consistently driven by our mission, create memories that last a lifetime. We're a motivated group, inspired bunch, working collectively to meet our clients' requirements. Um, just some pictures. I mean, everybody's always in a great mood coming kayaking. I mean, they're on vacation. You know, I've been in some other businesses, and I'll tell you, it's just everyone's always in a great mood. <laughs> um, and uh, just a little bit about us. Um, Explore Algoma is the name of the business up in Algoma. And uh, we've, we've been established since 2018. Um, working with the city, you know, just in the short time we started it, and there was absolutely nothing in Algoma. There's, it's basically fishing and bars. So I kind of had the idea, like, what's something else we can do when the families are here, you know, instead of just the guys and kind of try to get the whole family there. Um, but some accomplishments we had um, along the way here, I mean, we've had over 1,500 customers, which doesn't sound like a lot probably, but up in Algoma. It's actually quite a bit. Um, keeping a five-star rating on Google um, with 22 reviews. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about Google reviews. They're hard to get. I give away free kayak rentals to get them, and it's hard to keep that over three years. 1,300-plus um, followers on Facebook. Um, we do giveaways, kayak giveaways, and things like that, so we get a good following. Um, we've been featured in several major news articles. Burke County Pulse, Green Bay Press Gazette, Milwaukee Journal, and more. Um, we actually had Justin uh, Steinbrink come out uh, last summer and do a 
Good Day Wisconsin um, <coughs> cool series. Let me tell you, they get up early. <laughs> <laughs> we had to be there at, uh, I think it was 5, 5.15 or something. So they're up, they're busting butt early. <laughs> um, so that was a pretty fun experience. Um, you know, and as I had said, did the same thing. I brought the vision to Oklahoma, and they just absolutely loved it because, you know, it's a family thing. Every it's kind of the ongoing, or the trend, you know, for kayaking right now. Um, and we just kind of brought it to life and made it a reality. So, um, and like I said, we like to help with charities, be involved in the community. Um, it's just something everyone likes to do. They bring out, bring their kids out. And everything, and um, especially wounded veterans. Really looking forward to working with them this year. My dad's a vet, so kind of personal there. Um, and here's just kind of some of our rentals and services that we have. We got single, double kayaks, um, paddle boards, pedal boats, fishing kayaks, uh, tow behind goolers. <coughs> those, keep those beverages cold um, on site lessons uh, guided tours group events you know we've had people come for after they did a wedding they'll come kayaking or before um, we've had corporate events and we've had quite a quite a array of uh, different types of events um, here's kind of where we're gearing towards with Algoma and obviously possibly uh, if we were to get a location here, but um, jet skis, tiki floats, looks pretty fun there. <laughs> um, leisure barbecue float, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those, but they're kind of neat. They're just uh, electric, motor driven. Um, big wheel pedal boats, I know if the kid knows, you know. Um, single and family bike rentals, and actually happen to come across your strategic plan and the court plan actually after I kind of made this and you know this whole concept seems to really fit in good with you know where you guys are kind of looking to gear things um, as I said here's a proposed site and um, you know with it being a flood zone I don't know if it's feasible with it being temporary structure structures or whatnot or you know it always be open to maybe a different spot in the park um, but I you know, put that down for you there. Approximately a 45 by 90 foot, 95 foot area, just for the storage. You know, average kayak is probably between 10, 12 foot, 9 to 12 foot in itself. So, um, just uh, the equipment. Kind of give you a little visual. Actually, the pier put in this exact um, kayak launch over um, right across from St. Norbert's. A boat launch out there. Uh, it's an easy launch. It's ADA approved. You know, uh, it's pretty accessible for anyone. And uh, just some storage, lockers for everyone, kayak rentals or uh, kayak racks. You know, lock them up at night. Um, and uh, basically, some items to address. I think you guys have kind of seen all this. Um, but just some things, you know, minor details to work out that I guess we could go over if you're interested in doing anything. Um, just kind of the way we work things with Algoma. Um, you know, I, I saw that you guys are looking to possibly do a kayak launch. I know a lot of other municipalities have gotten grants for their kayak launches. I don't know where you guys are at with that or not. But basic water supply, power, you know, just for basic maintenance, operations, restroom facilities, you know, I kind of just drove over by the boat launch. I don't know what there is, but at other location, we just provide a portage on. Um, long care, kind of simple. We have to take care of that in Algoma. And, um, signage, where we could put signage. Um, and just kind of working with you with tickets, you know, just trying to get the name out back and forth um, if we were in there. 
So, um, I mean, it, it's a real quick overrun of, of it, just to kind of give you a visual of, you know, what's possible there. Um, it's, uh, we've, we've had great success in Algoma, and it's just been something that everyone just really enjoys. It brings a lot of people to the area. Um, I mean, the park that we are in, you know, barely had many people even come in there, and obviously don't have that pro don't have that problem at that Schwab May, but you know, it brings a different trend, you know, a different kind of look and recreational uh, option out there. So um, I don't know if you guys have any questions or how many how many rentals um, do you um, do a year approximately in Algoma? <laughs> Uh, well, obviously every year they're getting to be more, you know, so, you know, over 1,500, so it, I mean, you average that out to over 500. Yeah. So we've had some internal staff discussions uh, with the administration on this, and there's a couple of things that, you know, that would obviously need to be discussed in depth. Um, moving forward um, at staff meeting on Monday morning uh, our community development director uh, let us know that uh, it's a floodplain and so that we wouldn't be able to do any kind of thing there um, I, I, I know it would I'm sorry Rex what did you say it is a what floodplain flood zone okay, missed that. okay thank you um, so, what does that mean? I, I'm, I'm not sure what that means. I don't know if we could, if there could be something temporary there in the future um, with the shipping container. I'm guessing, even though that's movable, it may still be considered a, a stationary or permanent object. Um, that'd be a, a bigger question for, for for Aaron to answer. But it, it, initial feedback I, feedback I've had is is that's not the spot that that we could do it in. Um, <clears throat> There's other issues, there's obviously bigger issues. I mean, this would be our first commercial venture where we actually lease out one of our public parks for for private business. Um, and I don't know, it, the question is, is the village wanting to do that? Are they willing to do that? Are they willing to try it? Um, and that's the discussion for in, in the future for park board and, and obviously for village board to do. Because it's a change, we, we've never, We've never done that before. And not that other places haven't. I mean, there's plenty of municipalities that rent out concession stands to private businesses. Uh, Milwaukee County Parks is a, is a really good example. Um, they've got several lakes and, and uh, water areas down there where they, they have private contractors do like paddle boats and things like that uh, where they're renting that out. So it, there's, there's a lot of examples out there where they have this public private partnership. The question is whether Ashwabanon wants to, to try that out. And uh, with, like with Algoma, you know, they really haven't done that either before. And when I brought it up to him, the mayor actually happened to be there and he's like, well, let's hop in the truck <laughs> and follow them down. He's like, I got a spot for you. So we went down to the park and we looked at it and they had an old shack that from 20 years ago, run down and we renovated it and actually a little we used to sell perch over it, I guess, which could get a perch plate for the price. It was like five ninety five in their venue they had. <laughs> but we renovated it, and they just leased the section to us, you know, and it was in the lease, and we have liability insurance. Um, everyone signs waivers that goes out. Everyone has life preservers. So the liability gets taken off of the city or village 100% as far as liability reasons so that's how we worked that aspect of it so then it basically just comes down to a lease like you would lease anything else you know so a couple of the other things too is just regarding utilities I know in your list of things that would need to be worked out Don you mentioned that uh, you would need power to whatever area we're uh, you know, we'd be we'd be looking at or, or considering as well as you're going to need a water source to, to, to wash things down. And, and right now we, we have neither. 
along the waterfront. Now with the bridge coming in, hopefully the bridge coming in if the project gets approved as we continue to move forward on it, um, you know, we potentially will have power at the north end of the park. Um, but that's really the only place at this point where we even have that. We don't have running water in any other spot. So obviously some logistical details would need to be worked out public works wise, um, you know, in terms of running utilities. And, and then it's a matter of, you know, who pays for that? Um, can they be used for other, the other things? So it, you know, so it wouldn't just be for a Schwabenon Adventures you know, they could be used for the water or utilities could be used for other events. It's a possibility. Um, so that's something that obviously needs to be further discussed. Um, and if what, let's go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I, if, I mean, obviously don't expect you to you know, run utilities and all logistical stuff like that if it's too expensive initially. You know, I mean, there are other options initially you know, to get off the ground, probably like solar power. We don't require a lot. I mean, it's basically run a laptop for, you know, check-in and things like that. You know, there are some fans. You know, there isn't a lot. It's not a lot of electricity, electricity required. <clears throat> so. I think one of the other things that, that, that needs to be brought forward um, that we did have fair amount of, of staff discussion on um, is just uh, we've got a fair number of people on Broadway uh, you know that have homes on Broadway that even though that's separated by the channel there would be a lot more activity you know i.e. a private business across the street in the park um, obviously we're trying to tread lightly with with the bridge project quite honestly um, going across the channel because there are some folks that aren't, you know, aren't necessarily in full favor of it unless we're, we're able to try and mitigate some of their concerns. Um, and it, I guess which boils down to the timing of, of the project and whether 2022 is the right time to try and get this off the ground or whether we might want to look at it in the future. Um, the kayak launch has been on the core plan for a number of years now. Um, there's nothing new, um, and that includes kind of a redo of that that uh, boat launch area. In fact, that was going to be almost the trailhead, uh, the new trailhead for the Ashwaubenon uh, River Trail um, at some point, um, envisioning. <clears throat> um, but that was going to be phase either two or phase three of the project. Phase one is actually getting the bridge across. Um, into Ashwaubenon, and again, that's that's not a given yet, because uh, the plans still need to be submitted to the DNR. Even though we've got a grant from the DNR, they still have to approve the plans, and there need, needs to be a public public feedback forum for the residents on Broadway, and, and different things need to happen. Um, our hope is to do the bridge this fall or to start it. If 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 things move forward, if we can mitigate concerns, you know, from the neighbors up on Broadway, um, phase two slash phase three. One of them will include the trail around Eshwabame Park and the boat launch. Um, phase two probably is going to take the trail further to the south from the north end of the baseball parking lot or the lake parking lot, looping it behind Eshwabame Lake, uh, behind the new water treatment plant and into the Brown County Fairgrounds. That is, uh, I've had several conversations in the last year with, uh, with Matt Kreese, who's the park director for Brown County. Um, apparently they are, they're ready to go on it. They're, they're wanting to know where are we at because we, you know, we would like to get going on this trail that, that goes into um, the fairgrounds. So not real sure when the whole boat launch portion of it will take effect in terms of, of really taking a hard look at that and, and, and revising it, whether it be with our own launch, whether it be with the partnership with the private business. Um, but in inside discussion, you know, staff recommendation, at least coming from me, um, is that we're still looking at, there's still a lot of things going, a lot of moving parts and things that need to be worked out. That 2022 is probably not, you know, with 
summer only being really four months away, five months away, probably not enough time to get this off the ground. Um, but it's something that we want to, you know, certainly look at potentially for the future. You know, and again, that's where some of those deeper dive discussions need to take place. Um, is do we want a public-private partnership? Are we willing to try it? You know, and uh, you know, is Ashwaba Schwab, May Adventures the the business that we want to try it with? So, not real sure. I, again, those are much deeper discussions across the board, um, and, and that's kind of uh, just to let you know what some of those in, inside discussions have been right now. Do you know what the clearance is going to be under the bridge? I just was thinking some of his apparatuses look fairly tall with the canopies. I'm just so, wondering. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so initially, uh, before we had some public meetings, uh, the, the DNR requirements is five foot over ordinary high water mark. Meeting with many of the residents on Broadway, where they have larger, larger boats. Um, so right now, um, the initial plans are to, to go with 10 foot over ordinary high water marks for a 10 foot clearance. Now, if the water's down a foot or two, which, which it has been this last summer, mm -hmm. um, you know, then that, that leaves not only a 10 foot clearance, but, but maybe an 11 or a 12 foot clearance. So we're, we're trying without, without pricing ourselves out of the bridge, we're trying to find a, a middle ground and still accommodate some of the needs that the homeowners up on Broadway have gotcha. for, for their boats. All right, that was just one of my first. <laughs> yep. Right. Oh boy. <laughs> you know, and there is always, you know, I mean, I'm willing to work with you guys and I love the opportunity to do it, you know, whether it's this summer, next summer, um, you know, there's always an option to do it somewhere else on the park and maybe do it on a little bit smaller scale, kind of get the feet wet, get people just a little accustomed to it maybe not on such a full scale, you know, I mean, there's always options, but never, never works best for you guys or whatnot, I'd, you know, I'd be willing to work with what you guys have or have a vision for. Rex, real quick, um, how many homeowners are on that Broadway channel? Uh... <laughs> What do we have? Like 10? I think we have about, yeah, about 10, <laughs> nine or 10. Okay, because I, I just Google mapped it and it looked about like 10. So yep. I personally think this is a phenomenal idea. Um, obviously, like having lived in Milwaukee for 10 years and having friends from Milwaukee that travel up here and spend time at Ashwaba May. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those baseball tournaments when you're a little sister. It's absolutely the worst. So if I can beg my mom to go kayaking and it's right there, like that is that is huge. And I think a lot of the stuff that goes on when you talk about like music in the parks and you talk about, you know, the like you said, with the combining the coupon with the swimming and that sort of stuff, it does then become, you know, a family affair. I saw the double kayaks. I'm all about it. Um, so I think obviously, like, I don't know the ins and outs with power and water and plumbing. And honestly, it's important to keep in mind the residents who do live on that channel, uh, but they're also dealing with baseball uh, every night of the week in the summertime. So I think um, balancing a lot of those things, I, I do think it's something that's worth exploring, obviously discussing further with the village board and you know that sort of stuff. There's a lot of questions to be answered, but as far as like bringing something new and something different, um, you know, like what other municipalities in the area have something like this other than Algoma, obviously, but, you know, what else, um, you know, and then the prime real estate of having Ashwaba May, that is a beautiful park that is, you know, you know, people come from Milwaukee and talk about it and say that it's amazing. So, um, you know, I'm interested. I think it, it, obviously there's a lot more of discussion beyond my scope, but I, when I saw the proposal, I, I was definitely excited about it. And, you know, even you talk about stealing from the, the big cities, like I did, I did kayaking up in the Twin Cities with my kids a couple summers ago. Like it's just a couple hours and then you get tired and then you go eat ice cream and then you go home. So I think it's an excellent opportunity to bring something different to town. 
because people who come to Green Bay were more than just the Packers. We're more than just Title Town. Yep. Um, and I think you know that that the the park does have a lot to offer, and I would like. I would like to explore that a little bit further. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly what happened at Olsen Park um, in Algoma. I mean, we opened up, we had people come in, they're like, oh my God, this is just so amazing. And like, we're, we're coming kayaking, they have families, and, you know, Heidi mentioned uh, Milwaukee. You know, I went and checked out, uh, there's a big operation there. And that's kind of what sets us apart from other places too that just rent kayaks uh, we're like an all-inclusive we help people we put the kayak in the launch forum we push them out we tell them where to go when they come back we help them get out we get the kayak and i've had a lot of people say other places just don't do that like they go here here's your equipment you know we're fully hands-on and the place in milwaukee they go Two hour, or I think it's four hour or eight hour. Eight hour. That's all you get, you know. And we offer one hour, two hour, four hour all day, and they basically throw you in a kayak and that's it. You know, I mean, we take pride in it, and, you know, accommodate all cost customers. I mean, I've had a seven year old guy come there. He said he had like fifteen some surgeries and had to hold them, and he got in and he he thought he could never ever go kayaking or ever be able to do it. That guy had the biggest smile on his face, you know, after he was done. So, I mean, on multiple levels, like you said, you know, having to watch a baseball game, I mean, I was kind of thinking, you know, people can drop their kids off at the pool, you know, and they have you guys have lifeguards. So, you know, drop, drop them off the pool. I'm going to go kayaking, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's, it's all around, you know. I mean, not saying it just because this is something I'm kind of interested in too, obviously. But I mean, there's really been no drawback or really anything, any cons of any kind with over the last three years now. I mean, it's, it's been an excellent experience. So for the community and everything. I think Heidi put it really well. Um, I think it's, a, um, for me personally, it's, it's, it's a, you put a really good presentation together. Um, I think it's a really nice fit um, you know, the other stuff can get talked about, worked out, you know, we'd have to talk to, you know, I'm sure Joel would be able to give us more insight as far as, you know, do we want to get involved with a, a private business on the, on the surface, just because we haven't done it before, doesn't mean we can't do it now. Um, what do we have? um, you know, we, you know, you always want to look forward if, if it makes sense. Um, those are all, all things we could talk about. I definitely want to I'll get some more information and 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 just keep this process moving forward as much as possible. But Rex is right. There's a lot here that time-wise, it'd be really tough to do in 2022. I, I actually forgot my last slide that had the uh, plan one, plan two um, for imp <laughs> implementing. Yeah, not the best when it comes to talking and not get on stage ready. But um, I believe you guys do have it. Um, and I'm not trying to rush it by any means, but I mean, if it were to come to light where something you want to do, you know, obviously the power that can be solar paneled, um, the water, we actually work without water at Algoma. We basically, you know, spray everything and we dunk the uh, buckets in the <laughs> water just to do like a general wash down. Then we spray yeah, so there's a way. bleach, yeah, bleach but it down. And um, I do have a plan that would have you know a pre preliminary opening you know basically beginning of may or something that's with having marketing out and you know all that kind of stuff with, with you guys and that's probably something you know we're as we're talking about this proposal you might have to come back again oh yeah to Rex with another proposal and say, what about there, this? Or you there, guys there needs to be there needs, there needs to be site plans done, site plan, yeah. plan approvals, yeah. floodplain issue. I, I, I'm not against this by any means. No. Don't don't make don't make it out to be like that. <laughs> it's just that the, I just don't know if it's going to be feasible in 22 to put all the pieces together to make this a viable operation. I too would be against rushing it. I I think. 
just your um, visual of where it was, it's the perfect spot. Like, you know, I like, just I, drove in there and I saw him like right now like there's spaces and being used. I'm like, this is perfect. Right now there's two <laughs> concrete barriers and you know a bunch of sticks. Right, I mean like it's the perfect spot. Um, I just, but the floodplain yep. issue, like how much do we invest and. To, not to say it's not going to go, but if it doesn't go and we've now stuck this money in, we've got power and water for now we have nothing. That's one concern that I would have. Um, but And then the public access portion of it, I think the original vision of this was this is a launch for the public to use, and I, that's still got to be an option in my And I think you now, you don't own the dock, right? You're off to the side and you're helping at the dock, but... Well, the way you we know. work that is actually Algoma provide, provided the dock because they planned on doing this or putting a kayak launch in, kind of similar to what you guys probably are because just want to provide a community dock, you know, because kayaking is a thing. And they actually paid for it in full, and we share the dock. So, I mean, if the public, the public uses it and we use it, so, I mean, it's just a shared, shared dock, you know, and... Uh, you know, as far as um, cost-wise for you guys, I think that would, if you were to go in part or get the grant, I mean, I know there's grants out there, but if you were to um, pitch in towards it or anything like that, I think that's pretty much going to be your only cost besides, you know, if, I think electricity we wouldn't have to worry a, a lot about or the water. I mean, it's not, it's not a deal breaker as far as operating convenient <laughs> but um, other than that I don't think you guys would really have any cost into it besides Don I think it's a great I think everyone probably agrees that it would be a great addition to Ashwabamay Park yeah but you haven't maybe not worked with government too much government moves very slowly unfortunately oh, <laughs> so for us to get this going yeah. in 2022 is just it's yeah. it's too it's just not going to happen. There's too many things to think of and look at. Not that your proposal isn't good. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But staff needs to do their due diligence. Oh, yeah. There are grants available for boat launch areas, and the staff could probably apply for that. There also is another organization called Kayak Wisconsin. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They have, they've put in facilities down in Wrightstown, and they're expanding into Kimberly next year. Theirs is very basic. So they have a um, holder there or a rack. The, all the kayaks are locked. You're given a code of some kind. I think it's over your phone. You go, you go to the kayak. It opens. Well, you get your, you're yeah, about. you yep. get your vest. You get your paddles and everything, and away you go and do your thing. So they've been operating in Wrightstown, I think, a couple of years now, and now they're expanding to Kimberly. So I think it's just something to look at. It's a very basic. It's not as elaborate as yours. You don't have staff there. It's yeah. more like you said. You grab the kayak and away you go. So I think there's a lot of things to look at. Um, and it definitely would be an asset to the park. It may even tie in well with closer to the bridge. I don't know, you know, because the bridge is coming over. And maybe you've got fishing there, but maybe the kayak doesn't. But I think there's a lot of things to look at and definitely need to do that. And it would be a great asset to that park. Like Heidi said, I mean, the kid, you're there for a baseball tournament, and the, there's a daughter there who doesn't want to sit and watch baseball all day. Let's go out kayaking together. So it, it just is a real asset, I think. Even with that building that you guys rent out right up there for gatherings, I mean, you know, oh, usually yeah. people are sitting there for the day. You know, I'm sure yeah. they'd there'd probably be at least a couple yeah. people be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go down and tear to the family right now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, John, I, I think that your presentation was very impressive. Are you prepared to talk to the village board about it soon? The what? Are you prepared to talk to the village board about your proposal? Absolutely. I think what needs to be done first is is working with our code people to find out what what's doable and what's not before we even go to the village board. They're going to want more information when they when when the idea is first presented to them. Yeah, I'm more than willing to you know revamp you know whatever fits your guys' vision and you know what works. So I mean, make it the right thing, and when it all comes together, you're good to go. Yeah, we appreciate your interest. I think, like I said, I think it'd be an asset to the park. It's just a matter of working it all out. Yeah. So where do we go from here then? We um, 
this isn't ready to even have a board discussion with them, right? So, okay. I, 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 if there's any kind of a recommendation, Chris, I'd probably say just direct me to continue working with, with Don yeah. On, yeah. On, on trying to finalize a, uh, or get more information, you know, from other village staff on, on what is doable and what's not based on codes and ordinances, not only village codes and ordinances, but, but other governing bodies, you know, that, that, you know, I don't know what the floodplain rules are. I, I have no idea. So let's find out first what, what can be done, what can't be done. Maybe come up with, you know, option one, option two, option three, based off of that information. And that's the information then that is taken to the village board to discuss whether or not they want to entertain a, a public-private partnership. Yeah. Right. I don't know that there's a better spot in the park for it. Like, I think that's the spot for it. Oh, I, I don't disagree with you. I I, I, it's a great spot, and it, yeah. it's really underutilized right now. The only thing, I mean, I, and I see some people bringing their own kayaks, and they're, they're slipping them through those concrete barriers. Yeah. And, so I, it's already being used, and, and what a great entryway onto the Fox. You know, you got mm -hmm. a little bit of a channel, and it's it's safe, it's a safe harbor type of yep. thing. Yeah, safe harbor. A, yep. a few a few <laughs> challenges to the north is you've got those two fish spawning areas that we got the grants for um, immediately north uh, of, of the the north part of the park, obviously, mm -hmm. um, which would well be north. also immediately east of the bridge. Now, <clears throat> I think those are from the Fish and Wildlife Service. I, I don't know if we'd be able to do something right there because of those oh. fish spawning areas okay. that, that we got the 400 some thousand dollar grants to, to install. So what we might be looking at, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if the water flow, what, what, what's needed and again, something to look at if we could do something right off of the Fox um, or, or if, if we could do something closer to shelter number you see, but we've got the, the Heron and Egret platforms to the west of, of the bridge yep. that were put in, and you don't want to have a lot of activity in, there. in that area. So there's different challenges in terms of where option B and C might be, but that's something that we can try and, you know, do some more exploring on. What what would you envision your hours and staffing to look like? Uh, well, currently, I mean, it, what's the park open? What's their hours? Is it sun, sunlight or? Yeah, basically. Well, I, I, six in the, roughly six in the morning until ten at night. But yeah, I mean, ba until baseball ends, right? <laughs> <laughs> until the lights which go is, off. Which many times is past ten. <laughs> we, we do all our booking online. I mean, we we kind of we have the shack open too. We call it the shack in Oklahoma. And you know, we kind of really found it doesn't get busy much before nine. You know, we tried a little earlier. I mean it. Just, I mean, we'll work with wherever we see, you know, the demand. So, you know, around here it might be earlier, you know, and if that's the case, we would open up earlier, and then obviously we go till evening. Usually we take our last rental, you know, about 5 o'clock, because usually the most average time that people do is a two-hour rental, typically. So around 5, 6 o'clock, we'll put our last rental out. So it's open all day. There's always someone working there. So. Thank you. All right. Questions? Thank you. Yeah. Right. You don't need any kind of a motion then to, to, to keep moving on. I think it's appropriate just to, to direct staff to whatever you want us to, to do. OK. Somebody want to make that motion? Yes, a motion. I'll make a motion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> go, go I'm super excitable about this one, guys. Come on now. <laughs> I would like to make a motion that um, Rex and or whomever needs to do so has discussions with Aaron, with planning, and um, to determine the feasibility of the location of it and then go from there. Does that cover it? Yep. That'll be a good start. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Cool. Well, thank, thank you very you. much for your time. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Don. Thank you. We'll be in contact. All right, cool. Thank you. All right, D. 
Request for approval at Schwabba May Baseball Complex sponsorship and naming rights. Uh, Mr. Jay Krieger. Jay is coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, I don't know if Jeremy has my slides that he's going to show or. <laughs> Keeping you busy. So. Page Okay, do you just want me to call it out and you click it or I don't I can do it either way. Thank you. Oh, this way. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. All right. Well thank you everyone uh, for allowing us to present tonight. Um, to kind of start off, um, what we're really looking to do is to find a different funding source. Um, we, like every other co-sponsored organization or other organization out there, is looking for another funding source. Um, we obviously do concessions, and but we're looking for those larger ticket items. So that's the reason why I'm kind of before you tonight. If you um, So the uh, purpose here is we want to raise funds to improve the Ashwaubenon Baseball Complex. Uh, complex was built in 2001. I know Chris was there. Uh, we did a lots of, of things in order to make that happen. Um, since that time, there hasn't been tremendous amount of improvements capital-wise. There's been plenty of money spent there to do other things enhancements and maintenance and things like that. We're really looking to enhance it to improve that youth experience. Uh, there's a lot of competition out there now uh, in youth sports, things like that. We'd like to keep it in house. We, we really would, but there's a lot of pressure on that. One of the things we need to do is we want to get that top of class facilities, which Ashwaba may uh, baseball complex, we get nothing but compliments already on it. We just want to continue that to go forward. We also want to improve on the ongoing maintenance, uh, make the maintenance easier um, of the facility going forward. And we want to make those improvements with basically a minimal amount of, of village funding. Obviously, you all know I wear multiple hats. I know what budgets are about, just like a lot of you do. And, uh, you know, we really need to do this without having the taxpayers having to foot the bill all the time. So that's kind of the, the overall uh, purpose of, of what we're proposing here. So the goal would be is to attract sponsorship through signage and recognition uh, raise approximately $175,000 over five years. So this isn't something where we're going to be making one big pitch and getting a whole bunch of money coming in. We will then have this in place so that we can then roll it out as need be. We have some needs, obviously, immediately right now. And then there will be other needs that as they're coming up, we can then continue to expand this out and grow this and take advantage of the sponsorships and that, and not have to come back to Rex 
and say, okay, can we add this to the budget? Can we do that? Can we, you know, or, or could just go on? We're looking to see if we can get this in a, in a position so that we can make this ongoing. Ongoing sponsorship through the renewals and replacements. And we also want to maintain or improve the aesthetics of Ashwaubomay Park. We do not want to create uh, a park, uh, I'll use the Timber Rattler Stadium, where it's all billboards all around the field, things like that. That is definitely not what we're looking to do. We're just looking again to try to, to minimize, use minimal um, advertisement, things like that to attract these sponsorships. Quite honestly, we will be going after sponsors that would be friends of, of Ashwaubenon and baseball, things like that, who might be very interested in, in doing that. So some of the capital projects that we're looking at, um, Diamond 4 is in need of a rebuild. Uh, the maintenance staff has done, Glenn, Dan, the staff's done an unbelievable job with maintaining the field. But after a period of years, it just becomes required that you kind of gotta take the field out, regrade, re-level, get everything put back where it should be, and then rebuild the field. Uh, we also will probably be needing, needing a, a scoreboard replacement. We have been struggling with the scoreboard on Diamond 4. I'll be honest with you, I think Glenn has replaced every single part in that scoreboard. <laughs> and, you know, we'll, we'll get people out to continue to look at that, but at some point we're going to need to replace it. And that's kind of also why I'm saying this is something that we're requesting right now for everything. It's as things are coming up. We want that flexibility to go out and, and offer sponsorships in order to do these different capital projects because otherwise it's a lot of hamburgers to sell. And with the cost of everything going up, it's difficult to do it without having a, a, a more of a capital um, intake of money in order to be able to handle that. Uh, we have scoreboards on the other diamonds that need, uh, you know, they've been there for quite a few years. Uh, batting cages, uh, we're already starting to do some of this, um, and but we can't replace them all. Bathroom upgrades, those bathrooms are, are the same way we put them up, Chris. Hadn't really been a lot of change to them. We need to do some upgrades there. There's no doubt about that. Jay, for the batting cages, are you talking just about the, like the netting around them mainly that are replacing? Netting, and you'd be replacing some of the... Um, Framework. Just the infrastructure in order to hold the netting up in that. At the same time, you know where I say improve the aesthetics of Ashwaubenay Park? I'm going to be the first one to tell you, I, the current batting cages that are there are not aesthetically pleasing. So we're trying to put up cages now that are going to look better. The new cages are also slightly safer, uh, as Kyle can attest to. Uh, we do have... Um, balls that careen off some of the side posts and take really ugly bounces and strike the pitcher, who, even though they're behind an L screen. So the new cages Correct. have the poles on the opposite end, so that limits the side. So they're pretty high tech. Um, really, yeah. They're going to be really nice. The two are going to be really nice. Plus aesthetically, and when and I talk about improving maintenance, they're going to be much easier to put up and take down. Yeah. So, so those are some of the things that we're looking at. Dugout expansions, uh, concession stand equipment replacement. That's something where, you know, could we put a full kitchen in at some point? We probably could. We could probably do more with that. Uh, that's something right now we don't even consider it. We wouldn't have the funding in order to be able to do something like that. Dugout expansions. Uh, when we originally built those dugouts, uh, teams that were coming in typically would be uh, smaller. I can tell you that I have teams coming in right now on the high school level. They're hanging out of the first base dugout. They can't even all fit in the dugout. They'll be out on, on picnic tables next to it, things like that. Uh, if you have 15, not a problem, but a lot of these teams come in with bigger teams now. And uh, that's a challenge. So there's some dugout expansions we'd be looking for. And then just to uh, bullpen improvements, put in some good solid bullpens, make some changes there, both from a safety perspective and then 
and there'll be ongoing other things. Um, uh, I, I have nothing but an appreciation for what uh, Rex has done. Um, he's got an ongoing plan to replace dugout roofs and to constantly be doing upgrades to netting and fencing. And, and I mean, it's very appreciative. It's, and that's why that needs to kind of continue. But we need this different influx in order to be able to um, tackle some of these things to make the uh, improvements to the facilities. <clears throat> so some of the sponsorship levels that we'd be looking at, we'd be looking at some naming rights on the baseball diamond, diamond four, uh, as well as the other smaller diamonds, uh, scoreboard numbers, um, and again, these are numbers that have just kind of done estimates based on what things cost uh, is where these come from. Is that an annual amount? No, that would be over a five-year period is what we'd be looking for um, from people. So, and a lot of that when you get into sponsorship and naming rights, obviously it's gonna be negotiable. Yeah. You know, it's gonna end up being negotiable depending on who's doing the sponsorship. Uh, dugout signs, and I've got examples of all these that I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, three dugout signs on the larger dugouts and diamond four, two signs on the smaller dugouts on the other three diamonds. The batting cages, uh, their costs, and then we'd have minor sponsors that also could be doing donations that we would, we would, we would recognize. So if how are we gonna recognize these? Well, the first one, first way is we would have a, a, a plaque that we would put on the uh, concession that would recognize all of our sponsors. This is an example from uh, Manitowoc, and I will thank Rex immensely because uh, he takes his camera when he goes off to all these and takes all these pictures, so that's where these are all coming from. I'm saying that out loud so that his wife doesn't complain about him doing that in the future. <laughs> I very much appreciate it. <laughs> so we would, we would put a plaque like this. You can kind of see the position where we'd have it on the uh, concession stand. We might even put one over. Those of you that are aware of it, there's a, um, an area kind of where we have a glassed in area. Maybe even put a plaque in there. So there'd be a couple places where we would recognize. And you can kind of see by the plaque, there's different levels. And that's where the different levels would be recognized on, on this plaque. And you see on the bottom there, those are kind of the minor sponsors that I referred to and how you would uh, recognize them. So again, trying to be very minimalistic on, on the way we're, we're approaching this. As far as the naming rights go, uh, we, would, we would put on the scoreboard, on the top of the scoreboard, which I will note there is actually a sign up there now, very much out of date. That's long gone, the, their sponsorship is long over, we just uh, have neglected to actually move on this sooner than what we probably should have. And then we would put a plaque on the back of the dugout. I personally don't like exactly where that is right now and the size, but it would be some sort of plaque to recognize that company. Um, so we'd have the, uh, the naming on the scoreboard and then we'd have a plaque on the back of the field. What this would lead into is we would no longer be calling this Diamond Four we would now be calling this, and for this example, we just grabbed a name because within the village, Lemieux Field. We would start to reference the fields by, by those different names. We would obviously, for naming rights in that, we would have a, an opening ceremony, we would recognize that sponsor, we'd do a number of things, and then as we're moving forward, all of the documentation and things that go out to all of the uh, AYB, um, families and that would all be referencing the different fields where the kids were playing on and, and, and the like. So that would be kind of where we, way we'd be looking to recognize for the naming rights on, on four. We also have the proposed scoreboard change. We would then utilize the sign underneath the scoreboard. Uh, they're saying your, scoreboard, your score provided by ABC company. There's already a sign right there that was in recognition of the windscreen, which um, we really aren't gonna move forward with that windscreen anyways. 
Uh, I might put it up again this year, but it's pretty well shot. The wind is, did it in very early. And I'll, I'll credit Rex for recognizing that even before it happened. Um, then we, the other recognition, naming rights on the field one through three, kind of be um, following the same thing. Obviously, it's not as large of a money amount, but we would put the sign across the top, which is already on the scoreboard. We would then put something on the backstop as well, uh, a sign to recognize uh, that particular sponsor, and that we would do on each of the three fields. And then we put again the scoreboard sponsorship, we would recognize that underneath the scoreboard just as we had in Diamond 4. Other sponsors then, the dugout sponsors, and again thank Rex for the pictures. Uh, this is something that is being done in a number of different ballparks, but we would put something baseball themed wise on the back there of the dugouts to kind of recognize different sponsors. And what they're recognizing, there would be three on the, on the, each of the dugouts on Diamond 4, and then there would be two of these on each of the dugouts on Diamond 1 through 3. And again, everything there would be more of a, a baseball type of theme so that you can, um, it, that it kind of flows into the, into the ballpark and helps with the aesthetics of it. You would not be putting signs along the outfield fences? Nope. No. Nope. Then for like the batting cages, we would be putting up signs. I kind of like this, um, you know, as a field thing, you know, for each cage. Or if we are lucky enough to find a sponsor to sponsor all the cages, we would put this up basically on every one of the cages. And this is ABC cage. So this is company ABC. Uh, this is the cage that they then sponsored. And uh, again, just a plaque on the side of the cage to, to recognize that. So where we would be at is, um, you know, if we get approval to move forward here, uh, that's when we would go into that next phase. Uh, we would set up a, uh, a group to start to work on that. We'd identify those potential sponsors. Um, we'd meet with those sponsors, get their approval. Then the sponsors for the fielding rights, we'd obviously have to bring them back because per village ordinance, we have to get anything that's being named to come back before uh, the park board and before the village board. And once the, we would get through those processes, then we would start uh, bidding on those particular items that we have in the capital project uh, budget and start moving forward with them. Again, the whole overall purpose is really trying to find that additional uh, funding without having to come back and hit budgets back at the village. Try to be that co-sponsor type of, uh, of an organization and, and get out there and do this. Uh, I, I believe there are, are people out there that are willing to help the different organizations for all the good that they're doing for the three to 400 kids that are in the program. And um, I think this is uh, very valuable. So any uh, questions that you might have for me? I have a couple. Um, you said this is a five-year project, so you're going to try to raise the 175000 in five years. Over a period of time, Over right? Period, right. So let's say I'm the sponsor of Ball Field 4. Mm -hmm. Is my sponsorship then naming rights for a five-year time span? Because Correct. Like, okay, so then after five years, then if I wanted it again, then there would be an additional You're going to kick cost. another so additional So you guys thing. are going to keep track of that, and then the signs will come down or come off. Same with then the scoreboard sponsors. If someone Correct. does a scoreboard, it's, again, a five-year Commitment when that done, they don't re up. Then you go out and try to find somebody else that maybe absolutely correct. Which and, and that's what I where I refer to. We haven't done a good job of that. Yeah, it's <clears throat> hard to keep up with that. Yeah, correct. Yeah, um, the backstop plaques, the balls that are on there, or no, I'm sorry, the backstop plaques. Yep. How big are they going to be, and how high up? Because I would hate to see them. <laughs> Blocking someone's view. Uh, that's that's why I said the actual mock-up that I got. I don't like where it is. <laughs> I 
I, I, I want it to be up high enough. I want it to be visible. I might actually want it to be more on the side than in the middle, on, on the wings going this direction, up high. Uh, that showed like a four foot section. I don't know. We don't need a four foot section. I mean, it just needs to be a two by two by three type of a, a plaque. So that just so it's visible, and that the sponsor, you know, is getting their recognition on it. That's kind, that's kind of what I'm anticipating and imagining. Okay. Then what about the dugout? The balls on the dugout? How big are those? Those look huge to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just me trying to make them. You know. Oh. They, they, they were big. That's, uh, that example came from Manitowoc, for the Manitowoc complex that was just built a couple of years ago. They're, they're probably three, three foot. Three, yeah, three foot. Probably about a three foot around ball. Yeah. Not that big. But on the back of a dugout. It looks clean. Yeah, it, it's not. It what? It's not what? It's not that big when you put it on a, <clears throat> on a, you know, a 25 foot back. wall. Because it, right. it was on a fence, it would, but on the, I'm always big on putting something where there's already backing. I, but. I think the aesthetics of it, the roundness makes it look bigger. I wonder if we did pennants, green and gold pennants, shaped instead of a ball, you know, on the back. Small, yeah. It would it would blend in more. Yeah. The color, the, yeah, your the color blue. is what draws your eyes. Yes. It's more of an, it, they're big, yeah. but it's an optical illusion because it's right. on a different colored backstop. So if we blended the, a pennant shape, in with the, the color scheme, maybe? When something is round, there's a lot of area that's not yeah. covered by, True. you know, it's hoisted, so to speak. But your idea of the pennant, the whole thing could, name could be on there. A pennant or uh, a home plate. Or a home plate. Okay. Something. The round I, is what. You know, you want to obviously stay with the baseball theme. Because, yeah. you again, aesthetically, you want it to fit in, the, in there, so. Um, this was an, an example that you know Rex had, had seen, and I thought it was a, a great idea. But yeah, the points you bring up, yeah, it's especially Mark with the round. Yeah, I mean, it, there's always a lot of open area on it. You got to put a little. Yeah. I think my concern, just <clears throat> as the director, um, I don't want to say concern, but the, the village has always been. As, as Jay alluded to a little bit earlier, wanting to be fairly minimalistic on signage. Uh, the village contributes both financially um, and in kind. Uh, probably, well, three, four years ago, we were at about $28,000 is what we figured out. Staff time, costs, actual dollar amounts, helping with the umpire payments, water bills, utility bills. Um, pumping out the grease traps, that type of a thing. So we were probably spending about 28 on that. So the thought was, and I may be wrong, but I don't think so. This is over the course of the last 16 years when, when these types of things have come up and been discussed at the park board level. Because of all those in-kind services, the, the, um, we didn't feel like we wanted to, to do a lot of sponsorship, you know, and, and have a lot of stuff plastered all over like some facility. You know, you, you go to, you know, Timber Rattler Stadium, and I'm, I'm trying to do a good analogy here. Maybe it would be, uh, I think maybe Hortonville had, had just tons of signage everywhere. I mean, everywhere you looked, there were banners and signs and stuff like that. And it just, it looked cluttered. It looked Careful cluttered. what you say about Hortonville. That's my alma mater, buddy. I'm not, I'm, Hortonville is a wonderful community. Wonderful community. <laughs> But, but, Most spirited class of all four here, guys. <laughs> but, but, but hey, they do have a cluttered ball diamond. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't play ball, so I'm okay. Um, <clears throat> lost my train of thought there a little bit. Um, where were we at, Jan? Right here. Oh you were just saying. You were good just job. saying how good of an idea it was. <laughs> you were at clutter about the, clutter, the clutterness yeah. and everything. Yeah. And, but you would also. Sorry, so buddies. It's all right. So we're 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 trying. I think the village has always tried to minimize that due to the in-kind services that that were being delivered. Plus, you know, especially. Well, I don't want to say just because of Ashwaubenon, but really it goes for all of our facilities. We we want a more natural look. At our park facilities, we don't we don't want a lot of commercial. We have never historically wanted a lot of commercialization in our parks, whether it be in a baseball complex, a softball complex, or really anywhere. We try and minimize that, so that people, when they go to the parks, it's it's a relaxing 
aesthetically pleasing experience for, for our residents and our, and our non-residents. That being said, I think there's, there's certainly opportunities um, with signage, as, as Jay has some pictures here, that, that, that wouldn't detract to the point of, I think, raising a lot of concerns, not only from, from staff as well as, as residents. I, I will say we need to be careful with what we allow because if it happens here, it's going to other other co-sponsor organizations. I guarantee you will be knocking on our door next. Yep. AGSA will come and they'll want to do stuff at Pioneer, and I don't know if they can do stuff at Pioneer at least on Diamond Number One and Two because that is a school district property. Same thing with the Ashwaubenon Swim Club. They've they've asked when that pool was built. Can we do advertising in the pool? Well, it's within the school building. Technically, it's still the school even though we own it. And so that's been shot down, you know, that we couldn't. So, you know, so then is it fair that, that one organization gets to raise $175,000 and other organizations can't because of the challenges they might have in place because of where their facilities are located, um, so on and so forth. So, and again, these are things, these are not ideas that I'm just coming up with now. These are all ideas that have been talked about over the years of the challenges when, when, we're, when we're looking at this. But again, I, I think the dugout sponsors are, are certainly, um, in some of the signage on, on, the, on the buildings and stuff are, are certainly something we wanna look at. Jay, I, I'll have a, I, I do have one thing, and, and I don't know what we wanna to approve tonight or, or, or just proceed forward or how we wanna do it. I would ask that every capital improvement project because what once we have a building on a park facility, even though AYB might have paid for it, mm -hmm. it becomes the village's building. <laughs> like it or not. I know where you're going with this it, one. <laughs> it becomes the village's building. <laughs> yep. All right, so so we need to be careful of what we're allowing to be built or changed or put in. Right. Um, I'm going to say something that we didn't talk about because I, I didn't notice it until we just talked about it when you're talking about the full kitchen mm -hmm. in there. There's a reason we don't have a full kitchen in the community center, because the costs are astronomical from the health department once you put in a full kitchen, with with additional fire uh, fire suppression systems and, and things like that. Not to mention the mess, the mess that grease makes when you're in an actual restaurant, which is, you know. So, I, I would just ask. <clears throat> whether it be for AYB or any group that comes, that if we, if we approve, and, and I like the way Jay is doing it. Here, here's a list of projects and you're good to go on these projects. But that we, we take a kick at, at the cat for to make sure all these projects are viable and that there's no long-term ramifications with maintenance, um, whether it be on the village's part or on the organization's part of keeping things clean and safe You know, when, when you're doing some of those improvements. Um, Again, I, I, I think there's certainly room here to, to do some things. So that's my two cents. I've got, um, um, I think it's a good idea. Times are different than they were 20 yep. years ago, yep. 30 years ago, and you know, all that work was done. It's just, it's just different, obviously. Um, and to try to keep costs down to the village and hence the taxpayers, with minimal interruption um, aesthetically, I think um, I think you've accomplished that here for the most part. You know, there's there's things that we can people are going to disagree on. Absolutely. You know, I'm not crazy about the sign on the backstop. You know, things like that. But right. um, but that can all be you know right. hashed out. Then as far as you know, in the past, or worrying about other organizations coming in and being fair and not fair. Well. Uh, who, who, um, you know, we take every every situation differently, and um, the because because they all are different. Um, they're in a situation maybe they can't do it for some reason, and well, mm -hmm. then they got to find another way to fun fundraise. Um, I never was all about that um, with my kids or anybody else about always having to be fair. Um, um, 
you know, the times are dictating that what needs to be done. I think this is a good idea and if other organizations, you know, we're putting advertising on the, on the school gym, the, the basketball court um, over here. If the other, other organizations need to come into us and have the same conversation, let's hear them out, you know. I, I can say I don't have as much experience as these two with the AYB program as a whole, but the last couple of years at the tournaments that we were bringing in, all these outside, we had from Verona down by Madison, we've had outfits from Milwaukee, close to Illinois, you know, just in the youth programs alone that come up to play baseball. And just because I'm wearing a Nashville Avenon shirt that day, they stop me and they say, oh my God, you got such a nice facility, right? And um, we, uh, Jason Fonder just landed the regionals. Is that what he just landed? No, he ran state, state, so state legions for state double legion. A legion. So it's going to be here in here. 2023. So like, I think the mindset of AYB is improve this field to keep it a destination. And then we can go into the, like I said earlier with Cornerstone, that's 16, um, they had 16 uh, tournaments over the last two years that they brought all these people in from out of state and out of out of the area to come spend their time here, spend their money here, you know, patronize the hotels, the restaurants, the shops, right? So similar to this, now, now they can go kayaking maybe next year or the year after, but um, <laughs> it's not, you know, and, and the kicker is that AYB is looking to help, you know, fund fund these improvements so it's not on the dime of the of you know on my tax dollars right so um thanks for all the work looking into these things and you know if the if the if the if the impact on the signage can be minimal minimal and you're walking into a baseball diamond and you're almost expecting to see something baseball anyway so like as long as the back fence isn't painted right so <laughs> i'm it's a win-win in my book. Quick question. Is um, field four the varsity, high school varsity field? Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to say, I, I agree with everything that's been said, um, Chris, with the, I when you said like, f like fair, it doesn't necessarily have to be fair. I think we play the hands that were dealt in this life. And if some of us can't, like speaking from the other organizations, if they're not able to put up signage, then yes, let's think creatively about how we fundraise. I also like that this does not put kiddos on my doorstep asking me to buy coupon cards. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. then, then just let me pay my taxes for it because <laughs> those coupon cards always get lost anyway um and i've mentioned this over and over again um you know we have friends from the milwaukee area that come up and play at ashwaba may and like donovan said you know they they do comment about ashwaba may so let's let's keep it a premier um spot in the in the league and you know sought after and i think ashwabanan is such a a great nice little secret that we keep because you know obviously being surrounded or next to lambo and stuff but we we uh, we can hold our own and um i like that from a tourism perspective so i agree with everything that everybody said and, and i do like this proposal so good job thank you very much thank you i think jay what what um you put together here too being taking that minimalist um approach um i think that that advertising dollar for the potential sponsor um, becomes a little more uh, uh, challenging. No, well, no, actually, uh, um, uh, his, the return on his investment becomes a, a little better because people are actually looking at, instead of a oh. hundred out, outfield signs, they're that are just getting mixed in yeah. with no, everything else, um, yep. you know, they're, they're, you're, yep. you're, you're they're seeing they're just they're a couple show. businesses. Right or names or something, right. you know. Um, yeah. It's a way to sell it anyway. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, That's a different presentation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and this year, more than ever, that ball diamond's gonna be used almost every weekend, so yeah. they'll get all their bang for their buck. <laughs> I know sitting at plenty of hockey games during uh, down times, uh, and I'm serious about this, I'd, I'd just stand there or sit there and i just look at it, the advertising banners. Look at all yeah. of them. Yeah, Go from one to the next. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know. Right. Well, 
and baseball is all about a lot of downtime. Yes, it is. <laughs> that's why we limit the sponsor and pump up the concessions. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a good proposal, and I think it, you've really kept in mind the aesthetics of Ashwaubenay Park because it's a beautiful park, and you don't want to take away from that. And I'm glad that your proposal does, I don't, in my opinion, does not do that. Um, so I would make an, a motion that we approve AYB going ahead with their fundraising um, campaign and send it on to Village Board for approval. I'll second that. All right, we got a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? I just have one quick question, Rex. For sponsors, will the village have to approve the sponsors, or will AYB be able to get? Uh, there, or we have a are, list of like there approvals. There are already sponsorship guidelines okay. uh, right. regarding bars, uh, <laughs> tobacco, <laughs> things like that, okay. that that are that are handed out to the, the co-sponsor organizations. I, I, I guess I, I need to bring one thing up again, again, only because I've been through this once or twice before here in Ashwaubenon as well as with other municipalities. Um, if we're going to approve their sponsorship raising, what, what, I'm, what I would ask, Jay, is that you, you narrow down, you actually have a plan, okay? And, and this right. year we want to do this project, and this year we want to do this project, and this year we want to do this project. And, and, and before we, so that way, number one, we, we being the village gets to take a look at the projects to make sure there's no Concerns, you know, right. just like grills in the building type yep. of thing, you know, that type of yep. thing, you know, no. that, that we need that we need to work through. Absolutely agree. You with know what that. I mean? But but I, I would say a little bit more of a timeline. Yep. I, I want to say back in the days of Bob Monroe, mm -hmm. that's kind of how they did it, and they did a five-year plan. Yep. Um, they had this, this, and then by year, here's what we want to do every year with the money that we have coming in, and it worked real well. And then that right. kind of went away, and now I don't want to say it's more haphazard. But I, but I like the idea of having a plan because then right. if all those projects are approved within the plan, have at it. You don't need to come here all the time right. and ask for things individually. Agreed. It, 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 it's a lot slicker. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have no problem with doing it. This was a first step just to make sure that everybody was was on board with us moving forward with this type of thing. And then we'll, uh, we'll take, like I said, we'll, we'll put the next pieces together and... Uh, Come back. I'll present it to Rex, and if he feels that you know, bring it forward to you guys. That'd be great. So, all right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay. So we have a. Uh, did I finish that? We have a motion, and what passes unanimously. Anyway. Yep. So. Yep. Thank you, Jay. Kyle, don't talk so much next time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. E twenty twenty one community center report. All right, uh, David Brorg, our recreation supervisor, will talk a little bit about what's coming up here, um, or what, what's happened, excuse me, in 2021 at the community center. All right, well, I'd just like to say that uh, the report for 2021 is much better than it was in 2020. <laughs> uh, so things have bounced back um, extremely well as far as rentals and the amount of programming that we have in the facility. Um, so if you look at the first page of the handout, kind of looking at the last three years as far as the rental revenue we've brought in, um, before 2019, it was just kind of incremental increases every single year. Uh, we were at 53,000, some change in 2019. Uh, 2020, obviously COVID shut down for a few months. Um, I think the village did a very good job uh, working with the renters, we had a lot of cancellations, a lot of rescheduling. Um, so revenue dropped down to 27,800. Um, but actually 2021, uh, we bounced up, bounced back and actually were past what we were pre-COVID. So we were up over $59,000 uh, in rental revenue this year. Um, as far as the number of permits go, uh, 2021, uh, obviously our highest number of permits that we've had. Uh, we had 397 uh, permits for the year. Um, kind of breaking it down a little bit further, uh, 205 were paid resident permits, uh, 31 were paid non-resident permits. Um, the remaining 147 permits were internally booked. Um, the way we do it, as far as numbers goes, kind of gets a little bit confusing, um, but these internal permits, 
um, you know, we have AYB meetings, uh, soccer meetings, uh, different community groups like Girl Scouts, VFW, um, school district uses our facility for, you know, teacher training, um, <laughs> testings, um, different village departments reserve our rooms, um, and then we have park and rec programming. Um, so it's set, you know, it comes up to 147 permits. Um, but a lot of times when we book stuff, we bulk book it. So I'll book for Taekwondo class and I'll book 50, you know, different dates at once. That'll only count as one permit um, instead of 50 separate permits. Um, fitness classes, you know, we do twice a week, you know, over 100, you know, times that they're actually using it for the year um, still only counts as one permit. So basically when you add up everything between paid permits, um, different groups using it, the park and rec programming, uh, we had 2,754 total uses um, during 2021. So um, I know when the facility first opened um, five, six years ago, um, thinking how are we gonna fill the space um, all day, every day, um, it was pretty stressful, but I think you know if you come into the community center pretty much any day, there's always something going on. Um, sometimes we have you know three, four, five different things going on at once. So um, I think we've done a good a good job, you know, kind of using up that space that we have. Um, as far as some of the building repairs uh, this year, one thing that was unexpected, um, that was a little bit spendy, was we had to unexpectedly switch our web server that we use for our HVAC system. Um, it used Adobe Flash. Adobe Flash actually went away completely. Um, which is something that we never really anticipated or were warned about before we had to make the switch. Um, so we actually worked with Hayes Mechanical, um, who does HVAC for um, Village Hall here. So it's a company that we're comfortable with already um, to switch over that software. Uh, this was a cost of $3,695, um, but they've been, they've been a great company to work with anytime we have a question or an issue, um, you know, we call up, we call them up, and they're, you know, either stopping by the same day or can kind of walk us through uh, any troubleshooting that's needed. So, um, yeah, so that kind of stunk to have to switch, but like I said, so far working with them, we've been we've been happy with with uh, having to work with Hayes. Um, one thing that can be kind of an issue with some of our um, rentals that we have. Um, sometimes uh, we have to keep money from security deposits. Uh, there were seven, seven different security deposits that we withheld money from in 2021. Uh, that was a total of $987.50. So if something gets damaged um, with the rental, uh, we bill them for the cost of that. If there's additional cleaning, uh, we bill them at a rate of $50 per hour. Um, we try to take pictures, we try to um, I guess document as much stuff as we can so that when uh, there's a discrepancy over that, we can show them, hey, this is what we had to do. Uh, this is why we had to keep that amount. Um, obviously, that's an issue that can be kind of sticky sometimes. And, um, you know, we've had to kind of communicate back and forth with some of the renters to kind of work our way through that. David, of those seven situations where you had to withhold, is there a pattern set up as to? Establish as to what the problem was. Was it cleaning or damage mostly? Uh, or a lot of a lot of it has been more cleaning related than damage related. You know what the problem is? Alcohol. Pardon? Alcohol. Uh, oh, and that's why across the board. We've changed. We've changed over the the course of the years that we've been open. We've changed our security deposit policy. Um, now, if you're renting past ten o'clock at night, um, there's a higher security deposit just to, you know, hopefully. You know, make sure we've got all those those costs covered. If you know, person is drinking and they're responsible, and they say, "Hey, I don't want to clean," you know, we can come after them a little bit, a little bit better with that. Um, I think we're at a good spot right now with our security deposit, where um, we've never. I don't think we've had to go above and beyond charging additionally um, past what we've charged them um, for when they took out the the rental. Has security? it ever been discussed? to raise the rental 
but then be responsible for all the cleaning. You know, we would hire out people to come in and do the cleaning, but raise the rental. I don't know how that would compare to. That was that. That's more of a philosophical thing, Mark. And when we built the community center, um, having the groups clean up after themselves, uh, it was thought that they would take more ownership in the facility by by having to clean up after themselves. With the majority of the people being residents, yeah. Um, so they take a little bit more ownership on it. Um, I, mean, I, I was I was just a little concerned with. And to keep uh, the price be, down, yeah, because be, they're they're you're already paying, you know, quite a you know for a twenty year bond for the community center and the other projects, um, the twenty years that you're paying on your 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 taxes for those facilities. So again, by keeping by cleaning up after yourself, it, it keeps the rental costs down. So you're not you're not having to pay your taxes for the facility and getting extremely high bills when you want to use the facility. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, that was a, a, a big philosophical discussion, a couple different levels when, when those facilities were, yeah. were being put up. It, it just came to mind that, I mean, people can know, know how to clean their house, but do they know how to <laughs> clean, but mostly, but do they know how to clean a, a bigger facility that has different types of cleaning equipment and so forth like that? You know. it, I guess the challenge with that too, if you know, if we provide a cleaning or a service to come in after the rentals is a lot of days, you know, we have two or three, sometimes four different <clears throat> rentals going on. So to try to get a group to come back and clean between every single group would be, would be a challenge. So, and like I said, for the most part, I mean. It works. Yeah, 99% yep. of the groups do a good job. And, yeah. you know, okay. some groups. They just don't want to clean. I mean, <laughs> so, and we've tried to do, I guess, a few different things to like combat that. You know, like I said, the security deposit is up to $500 after 10 o'clock um, compared to 300 if you end before 10 o'clock. But that 10 to 1 a.m. time can be, can be a challenge with people can kind of go over the edge drinking wise in that time frame, so. <laughs> um, the next page, uh, we do send out a survey form after each rental. Um, not everybody fills it out, but if you look through the um, numbers that are given here, uh, for the most part, you know, fives, fours across the board. Um, occasionally, we'll get one that I guess we're not happy with. Um, so we usually try to reach out to that group if possible. Um, I know there's one here where there was a couple threes, um, and that was just some issues with the carpet in the activity room. We do um, get it professionally shampooed, you know, usually spring and fall, uh, Stanley, Stanley steamer. Um, but, you know, that can be kind of a long time in between. Um, carpet cleanings, uh, we can't be doing it all the time. All it takes is one group to have a couple spills and your carpet doesn't look so good. So. Um, after we found that out, uh, we actually had a lot of, um, or a few extra carpet squares still left over from construction. So we swapped out as many of the carpet squares as we could, try to get it looking back um, to the way it should. Um, so that's a good, you know, a good thing about these surveys is um, kind of gives you some insight onto what the community is thinking and the renters are thinking as well. Um, there's another one um, that. I mean, really stands out as far as scores, you know, some threes, they actually gave us a one. Um, and that was kind of a difference on opinion and what should be cleaned, how it should be cleaned. Um, they had a... Is that the one we had to call the police on? <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Um, so it was a it was a difficult. I want to know more. Yeah, it was a difficult <laughs> it was a difficult situation the entire time, and I mean, with the amount of rentals that we have, that's going to happen from time to time. Um, <coughs> there were different expectations from what they thought they rented compared to what they actually rented, um, and and I think on that one as well the person who actually took the permit out and had all these rules and policies explained to them, they weren't at the permit? Correct. So the people that were there then were told for the first time what the expectations were, and they weren't happy. 
and they were doing they were doing a big cooking presentation for you know the guests that they had and they had rented the activity room in that situation you'd want to you know have a, a commercial style they kitchen should, like they should have rented the, the grand yeah. park room in the kitchen yeah because the activity room kitchen is basically a galley kitchen it's a not good for cooking demonstration. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and then if we go on to the next couple of pages, just some of the comments um, that we've received. Um, actually, quite a few positive comments in here. Um, and so not every situation has been been easy to handle, but um, we've got a good group of staff. David David does a nice job of, of, of picking who might do the best handling these types of situations. It can be it can be difficult um, to be a staff person, you know, if you're there, it's just you and you're having to confront a group of 200, 250 people, especially if there is drinking going on. So um, just making sure the staff, you know, knows our rules, policies, um, is willing to stand up for, you know, village property uh, when it might not always be easy to do. So um, like I said, there's there's some good. Good things written about, um, you know, especially Kathy Mellon and her husband, who both work for me. Um, one example is um, somebody in one of the rental groups um, actually ended up having a seizure, and just the way that they handled that situation, um, you know, obviously a difficult situation, but but they handled it well and um, made sure everybody was taken care of um, during that time. So, um, and then I guess the last page here. Now, uh, just kind of a look at some of the park and rec programming that we have taken place at the community center. Um, like I said, when it first opened, you know, it was kind of overwhelming to think of how we we're going to fill that space. But um, I kind of got a list here of a number of different programs that use the facility, um, you know, fitness classes, uh, different educational classes. Um, we've been lucky enough to partner up with some local businesses. Uh, Woodside has been good to, really good to work with. Um, they bring different professionals, they bring great lunches, and um, just the way their presentations have been the last few years, partnering with them, we've really seen a grow, like a huge growth in attendance. Yeah, we had, I walked in this morning, it's just like, holy smokes, what do we have this morning? Yeah, this morning we had partnered up with Oak Park Place. Uh, uh, breakfast with the expert class. It was a funeral planning presentation. Uh, we had 25, 25 people that attended that. So I said the the people that we partnered up with. Um, I always feel like when you provide food, um, our senior <laughs> group really <laughs> likes to come out. So um, <laughs> kind of know the way to their heart. So if you feed um, them, they will. Come. <laughs> yep. So and they, I mean, the food that they bring, I think, is is excellent, and they they enjoy doing it. I know. The chef over at Woodside likes to kind of try out some of his new recipes and, and bring it to our presentation. So. You know, another trend that I think um, our staff has seen, especially since COVID hit, is the amount of people coming into the community center uh, just to hang out. <clears throat> We've got that circular front, you know, the oval shaped, with all the chairs and tables. And, and, uh, we don't really advertise that, um, but people have just kind of found their way to the community center. And on any given day, you'll find different, you know, multiple tables being used where people are playing cards or playing Mahjong or playing, you know, who knows what games. I mean, it's nothing that we're scheduling. It's nothing that you know, no, no formal activity, but, you know, they're saying, they're calling, hey, David, let's go to the community center, call Bob and Steve, and we'll, you know, play some sheep head or something. And, and, and you're seeing that more and more. You're also seeing, um, and I think, I think it's because of COVID and the amount of, of dining rooms that are not available anymore. You're seeing more people just coming in and, and eating lunch at the table, at the tables with, with a friend. Um, and, and you know, almost almost like a dining room per se in, in the in the lobby area. Um, and and for the most food and bringing it, yeah, oh yeah, bringing in the fast food, absolutely. Very cool. Um, so it, it, it's a little bit of more maintenance work on on our part, but by the by the same token, I think people are usually pretty good about cleaning up after themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then then and then Matt comes in obviously every morning. That's the first thing that 
Um, he does our park maintenance guy whose responsibility is the community center. Um, and that's the first thing he takes care of is, is get the, gets the lobby all tidied up and ready to go for, for the upcoming day. So it's, it's truly turned into, you know, I, I it sounds a meeting, a meeting spot. Yeah, a meeting spot or a community center, gathering place within, within the community. You know, there's different kinds of community centers. When a lot of times when we were planning this whole thing out, um, they were talking about, well, what kind of community center do you, do you want? And you take a look at what the pier has. They've got, you know, a, a library and they've got, you know, a, a pool room, um, you know, with pool tables and, and, and very, very specific things with, you know, in, in each room mm -hmm. that can't be changed out. And, and I think our philosophy was the lobby is the general gathering spot. The rooms itself should be multi-purpose rooms where they can be changed out for, for multiple different things. And, and I think that was um, a real good decision, you know, when, when, when these buildings were being planned because it, it's, it's turned out well. Um, with, with the amount of, and the variety of programming and, and people coming in and wanting to use it. Um, we've got numbers of businesses coming in and, and renting your rooms out for, for trainings, um, you know, and because you've got all the, the Wi-Fi and, and then the screens that people can listen to and, or watch on. So it's, it's really been, you know, Quick Trip usually has, I haven't seen them in there lately, but I mean, they use it for, for, for almost, well, they had been using it for all of their trainings. Even photo shoot, like photo shoots for different businesses. Yeah, businesses come in and with with different pieces of furniture, and, and they just like the backdrop and the windows, and they they will rent the room out and set up a whole office in the activity room, and and take pictures of the furniture for their for their brochures and stuff like that, um, with with the community center, you know, being the the backdrop of it. So huh. it's it's interesting what a lot of people are using for. Even the kitchen, we've got. We've got a couple of people that come in that rent the kitchen out because they're um, as a commercial kitchen. Um, they they make product in there. They bring it out to the to the, uh, the the different stores that they sell it at. You know the grocery stores and stuff like. And, and we we've, we've got uh, a person who literally comes in every week and, and and makes different cream cheese dips and things like that in there. And, and uh, that keeps things being used. It keeps things being cleaned. A lot of times they will leave. It cleaner than they found it, you know. So it, it, it's really, you know, turned out well, and, and David's done a, a great job of, of managing everything that's going on over there. So, good. Is there a difference between the resident fee and a non-resident fee for room rental? Yes, there is. Okay. I, um, I want to say two hundred and fifty dollars for the large room. Um, it's a flat fee. And then 150 for the smaller activity room. In addition to, so it's yeah. a, a okay an up on top of okay. yeah on top of it. And then a little bit, a little bit more money too with the security deposit. My only question um, is, um, what were the police called for in that one incident? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> over the discrepancy on the. Uh, <laughs> We make them fill out a checklist, yeah. And um, they can throw out some back and forth, and then um, the renter kind of lunged at the staff person and tried to grab it out of the hands, and then the staff person called the, the police at oh. that time. So, so <laughs> very nice. So especially when you're working, you know, by yourself, um, I tell them, you know. Oh, that's scary. Yeah, don't be don't be afraid to call public safety. There, I mean, they're here to help us, and I don't want you to be stuck in a position by yourself. You know, when you're way outnumbered, so right, um, it's better to be safe than sorry in that kind of situation. Right. Okay. I just wanted to thank the Parks Department. I have been involved with the ABC Readers, which was at the library forever. And when the library started closing down, they do not have any group activities in the library anymore. So the community center was welcome for our book club to come there. So I appreciate it, and it's a nice home for us as well. So thank you for allowing us in. Yeah, thank you. We enjoy having all the groups come in. So it <laughs> makes it a little bit more exciting there. Yeah. Okay. All right, anything else? Thanks, David. Yep, thank thank you. you. All right. Uh... Thanks, David. 
All right, uh, Department of Recreation and Forestry Department reports. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and make this brief. I know it's been a, a pretty long stretch here. So uh, this is going to be a really busy, busy year. <laughs> I'll just leave mm -hmm. it at that right now. We're, we're already up to our ears um, in projects. Uh, we're working on the Eshwabo May River Trail Bridge project, obviously. Um, we're working on the lighting plan, um, and then we're already done with the first, the first rough designs, more of a bubble concept on, on the plaza viewing area, um, and, and those should be coming back for a second revision um, within for a couple of weeks. Uh, officially, we did receive the stewardship award um, that needed to go through the state uh, joint finance committee, um, and then Senator Coles uh, ushered that through, uh, as well as some other, some of our other dignitaries. Um, and so that was officially finalized uh, in early January. Uh, we're looking for engineering proposals for the Ashwaba May Park maintenance building. Um, uh, working with heirs on an engineering proposal because that retaining wall between the middle pass through parking lot at Ashwaba May and and the baseball diamond is starting to fail in spots. So we're going to try and figure out how to how to correct that, whether we need whether that can be fixed or whether it needs to be a complete redo. We'll see what happens with that. Uh, met today with a uh, playground manufacturer. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Smith Park playground um, that's coming in. Um, working a lot right now. We're, uh, I've sent out notices to all of the food truck vendors from last year and then probably added in or probably sent them out to at least another 10 that we that we have not had. There's actually a lot of food trucks in the Green Bay area. I mean a lot of food trucks, more than you would think. Um, so, you know, you try and find ones. I, I, I like a lot of food trucks on my, my own personal Facebook page just so I can kind of keep up on them and, and, and see see who's paying attention to stuff like that. And, and, and so a lot of those groups um, or, or vendors are, are ones that we send our, our application packet to and, and hopefully we'll be able to have a little bit of a turnover and, and get some new vendors in there from year to year. That's what keeps all those special events fresh. Um, is by having different vendors all at the same time. Um, so anyway, letters have gone out to the food truck vendors. I'm already starting to get them back uh, for the five food truck rallies that we have this summer. Uh, I think this week we're going to try and get out letters for to our sponsors uh, for our Wednesday lunch concert series as well as our, our food truck rallies. Um, and along with that, um, I'm knee deep right now and trying to put together my band menu. I'm trying to figure out what bands are out there, who can perform on what days and what nights, and then you put down the price, and then and, and then we send them out or meet with a lot of our sponsors. Some, some sponsors are, are really good where they just are, are willing to sponsor, and but some want to sponsor a specific band. Or, hey, I know this guy. It's my brother-in-law. I want him to play. I'll pay for them type of a thing. So just kind of working on that, working together with uh, trying to get the band scheduled. Um, we'll probably have at least seven or eight Wednesday concerts again, um, coupled with the food truck rallies. I mean, we're talking probably 14 or 15 concerts, you know, this coming summer that we're, that we're looking to, to try and work on. That on top of, of, of Eshwabanon's turning 150 years old, this year we have the sesquicentennial. That'll be a week long of events, um, August 8th through the 14th. Um, it'll start with a grand opening ceremony over at the Ashwaubenon High School football field on uh, the track in the bleachers area. Uh, we're hoping to have some different like marching bands perform. We'll see what happens there, as well as the high school band. Um, and we have monthly meetings with all of the area community organizations, um, Lions, Kiwanis, Elks, <clears throat> I, 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 there's a whole list of them that, that we meet with as well as the school district. And then we also have the 150th executive committee that makes kind of tougher decisions um, to take it out of the hands of, the, of all the community organizations. And then we're working with the historical society on putting together the, the sesquicentennial book that will be coming out that will be mailed to all of the Ashwaubenon residents um, probably in June. So uh, <clears throat> again, uh, it's, it's a week long of activities, Tuesday through, or Monday through Sunday, stuff going on every day. We're gonna be having a big 
recognition dinner at the community center uh, for for special dignitaries, elected officials at all levels, um, as well as, as as a lot of big business sponsors and supporters of the village in the past. So uh, we're working on that. So we've got looking at we're looking at doing a talent show. Uh, we're looking at doing some open houses. Uh, Friday night uh, we're taking the blast and we're starting it on Friday night. The blast will still be on Saturday. Friday night we'll all, we're looking at a band. Uh, the food truck rally, uh, we'll have a food truck rally on Friday night. Um, and then uh, we're also looking, working with sponsors potentially to do a fireworks show and some other, some other types of entertainment on that Friday evening. And then Saturday will be the big, the big show type of thing as it usually is. And then on Sunday we're looking at trying to have a pancake porky breakfast over at the community center. I got one group potentially wanting to do that. Um, so we're looking at different sponsorship opportunities for that. We're doing a lot of sponsorship opportunities right now, just trying to put a packet together and to meet with the different sponsors and, and, and whatnot. Um, Joel and Mary, I know, are, are, are kind of heading the charge on that. Um, and then with the Pancake Porky Breakfast, there, there may or may not be a vendor's fair, but there will also be a return after 50 years of Jerry Volker and the Jolly Gents. You laugh when I say that, but Jerry Volker and the Jolly Gents polka band <coughs> played at our centennial back in 1972. Wow. And he is still playing away. So how can we <laughs> not have him back? for the Cespa Centennial. That just seems right. Right? <laughs> so, and so we're, we're booking him. So we're just trying to, we're trying to figure out how to, how to wind the, the week up. So anyway, we have monthly meetings and, and, and so we're in full bore on that. And uh, it, it'll, it'll, it'll be my busiest summer since I've been here. I can yeah. guarantee you that right now. Your vacation is then August 15th. Yeah, my wife, the... Ke Kelly's not gonna be real Through September. Way. She's already not happy. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, a lot of stuff happening. Uh, some of the programs have started uh, in a couple of weeks only. Uh, in, within a month, uh, we'll be doing uh, registration at the community center for our, our summer day camp program. Um, hopefully that will go well. Uh, taking registration for the rummage sale. Uh, Mel kind of talked about aquatics a little bit. Um, a lot of swim meets happening. Um, Forestry uh, is still plugging away. They, they're they doing a lot of tree removals right now, trios. I think we've got the trees done in Ashwab in May. No, in Argon, they're starting in Ashwab. I think in Smith Park, I think they've been taken down already. Smith are gone, yeah. Those are gone at Smith, yeah. That should have happened like a week or two ago. And then Ashwab May is the next one. And, and that one has a lot of trees to take down. A lot of trees, unfortunately. Uh, Probably good that we take them down in the winter where it's not so noticeable. <laughs> um, but so Tim is is working hard on that, and and, uh, and and we've got different grant opportunities. We've got trees coming in, so we're we're trying to just juggle. There's a lot of stuff we're juggling right now. Um, but do you know? Question? Do okay. you know uh, they remarked like my street, um, but I think I'm out yet uh, over by Pioneer. I don't That'll think we're going to start until so, next year, right? So so last year was east of Highway 41. This year is west of Highway 41. Oh, so it is going to, yeah. they're going to start then. Okay. Yeah. I just yeah. noticed new marking, so I yeah. wasn't sure if I should be excited because yeah. the last time. And there, there's that. really no timetable. What we do is we just, we tell them you have from the start date to an end date. Yeah. Whenever you want to do it, that's fine. Because that then they can come in. Like if they've got a gap in, in other work that they're doing, if they've got a gap, a week gap here, a week gap there, they'll come in and they'll they'll do different pieces here and there, and it, and they like that because it keeps the crews busy. Um, yeah. So uh, there's no specific day or time of when different neighborhoods are going to be taken down per se, other than it, it should be this year. Cool. All right. Questions on anything that's on here or not on here? I have a question on the rummage sales. Last year we had a complaint from someone about the speed of people moving through the community during rummage sale weekend. Is there any way we can give out education, whether even, because don't you give a sign to people that are doing the rummage sales or don't I, you do it, it says it, it, it says it on the maps that we print out, you know, just, you know, 
cautious of people, you know, neighborhoods type of a thing. So whether they choose to read that, Tracy, I, you know, what, what, are you talking about the drivers or the, yeah. or the drivers, shoppers? People. We had a complaint from someone that the drive, they were concerned about the drivers not paying attention oh, during the summer sale weekend. I don't even do a it's, press it's release. It's wicked. There are people, people want to get those bargains. Now. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, uh, I got an opposite viewpoint on that one. Man, it's the people that are darting in and out of the driveways that are, man, alive. Yep. I go slow just because these, oh, yeah. oh my God. You mean people yep. walking like out and stuff? Yeah, yeah. leaving yeah, their yeah, cars cool. or yeah. going it's through their terrible. cars and yeah. they're not paying attention. And oh, yeah. Yeah, they'll walk right they're through the just, middle of the street. Oh, yeah. oh not even goodness. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. they're looking at the, <laughs> at the driveway to see what deals are there. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's an event. Yeah. <laughs> Typically on the rum sale, I think we, the last two years with COVID, I think we've had maybe about 120 or so. Pre-COVID, we're probably closer to 150. So we'll, we'll see what happens this year. <laughs> Yeah, maybe just like a reminder or something, or do a press release to the press saying, you know, just to tell everyone to know there's the big rummage sale in Atravanon this weekend. Please slow down, pay attention, kind yeah. of thing. Just yeah. an, to create an awareness, put it on the website. I mean, it can't hurt. It probably, most people won't see it, won't pay attention anyway, but yeah. what the heck? Yeah. Have to put it out there. So, yeah. I don't know. All right, items for um, <clears throat> for next, me next meeting. Anybody? I have a question. I don't know if we did this already, but we had talked about the southwest part of the community, so where the new subdivision is going in on the golf course, and having to update the comprehensive plan and look at maybe a park or trails up there. Did we do that? Do we have to do that? Or where are we at on that? Um, I know you got a ton of things. Other yeah, things no, we had, plate, we, had, we, had, we had. Did we update? I don't think we updated. I don't think we, I don't remember plan. updating I mean, that, it. That'll, that'll, that'll be, I think it might be mentioned in the core plan actually. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah, I, initially, I, I think it might be in somewhere in the fine print in there. Okay. But if, if, if not, when we, and I think we still have a year or two left on this one uh, before we have to go through that process again. And if not, it'll be added to the next one, to the next core plan when, when it's updated, we get comments from the public and that's the time that we kind of add stuff in, into that. Um, everyone at administration is all aware of, of, of that. I mean, I've talked with, with Mary and Joel and, and uh, uh, obviously the golf course, half of that is being turned into, yeah. you know, the housing development right now. Um, and the other half of the golf course, a lot of it is wetland area, but as more of it gets developed to the west, that's when I think we'll need to be talking with Aaron um, and any particular developer that comes along about setting aside, you know, designated land for, for at least a small park. Yeah, um, or trails or whatever, just trails, something yeah. that. The trails would certainly work in the golf course area, but Great. I mean, Sand Acres is so busy with kids on the playground and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. there, there, I think there needs to be a- Take some pressure off of Sand Acres. Take a little Acres. bit of pressure off of that, because yeah. it, it's really busy at Sand yeah. Acres, and it's only gonna get busier as Lawrence continues to develop and as, as those subdivisions come in in Ashwaubenon. I mean, I just have heard, and maybe rumors, but that the south end of the golf course is gonna be developed sooner than later, that they don't, they may not be running that anymore. Half, half of that is wetlands, so, yeah. it, so I mean, it's gotta be some creative development if it is. Right, yeah. I mean, just so we kind of keep in our head that and I know you're saying staff is looking at that, but I don't know if there's grants available, but it has to be in the comp plan. Some, and maybe there is something in there right now that would qualify for that for some grants for development or. Yeah, I wanna say for the trail system, I think it, it's more nebulous just about the trail system in the Southwest quadrant of Ashwaubenon. Continue to develop with that as, as things progress. progress. So it, it, I don't think it calls it out specifically at this point, okay. but it is close enough Okay. per se, you know, verbiage, I think that's in there. Okay, just, I remember us talking about it and I don't remember coming back through, so I just wanted to double check on it, so. So you feel we're okay with what's in there and we'll Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is, 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 is developers approach, if, if a developer actually has a plan for, for the additional land, you know, not necessarily golf course land, but 
stuff further to the, to west, the west. Yeah, for the west. That's the point we're going to need to take a look at whether you know we need to try and get some land and have another a space area for a park. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Update. Move to adjourn. All right. We have a, mo a motion to adjourn. I'll second. And a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Thanks, everyone. Good. Uh, good discussions tonight. Yeah.